press record. Gentlemen. Charlie. Yes. Yeah, just real quick. Hey, uh, right. can you put your video on? It's my video. I should have it on here. Is it on now? No, sir. No, it's not. It's okay. Zoom does that a lot sometimes. It goes here. Uh, Are you using your phone or uh, a PC? I'm on, I'm on a PC, but I'm on. Uh, here he goes. Let me get there. How about that? There, there you go, your, Coach. There's your good looking face. There we go. Great. How you guys, how Thank you guys you. doing? Happy, we're doing, we're doing uh, happy, great. Happy Saturday. Uh, I don't know what time it is there, but it's uh, around 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah, it's the same time, time. time as Rod is. I'm not burning up like Rod, but I, 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 I yeah, I'm, I, I know you guys probably envy us, but I, it's about 85 here, so we're, I'm not complaining. And uh, Coach, make, you guys make me jealous. <laughs> See, he lives by the beach. He lives in L.A. He lives, you know, with Hollywood, the big stars. Oh, Lucky Lord. man. Lucky man. Yeah, don't, don't believe that. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, hitting in the, I'm hitting in the foothills, staying out the way. But, uh, Smart. But, yeah, I, but yeah but I'm glad, you, know, I'm glad uh, you guys are, uh, got a chance to get you on the line. And like I said, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can from the standpoint of – because there's obviously many layers to uh, RPO football. But I like anything else. I'll talk a little bit about just the basics. If you guys want to interject at any time, uh, feel free. I think uh, what I'm gonna do, Rod, is pretty similar to yesterday, where I kind of gonna sh uh, share the uh, PowerPoint with them, and then as we talk about uh, some certain principles within the RPO, then I will uh, pull up uh, basically a front and a look that kind of identifies uh, what we're seeing and what we're reading. Uh, as, as far as what the quarterback's reading. And then how do we like the numbers and, and, and how do we attack that defense based on what we see? And so really, RPO is simply, as you guys know it to be here, run pass option. And it's really uh, bore out of the audible system where back in the day, Rod knows it very well, where you know if you didn't have a real good quarterback, you were pretty much stuck in a bad play. And then audibles became a thing where – you, it just allows you to just get into better play. But RPO is even nicer because obviously you're on the clock and sometimes you get into snap count, count and, then, and then defense shows one look and then they begin to get into another look and it's too late to actually get into a better play. So that's what makes the RPO system so attractive is you have three plays essentially when you hit the line of scrimmage. So what I'm going to do is, is, is kind of share uh, my screen and just kind of share the PowerPoint and like I say, and we'll kind of just go through this, um, you know, expeditiously here. Um, let's see if you guys want to see if, make sure you guys can all see it. And I'll go to the Great. PowerPoint. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. We can. Okay. So I, I kind of just put this together, uh, me and Rod, and, and I didn't want to be too elaborate, but I wanted to just kind of put some stuff there and, and we run the RPO. So we run at a few high schools that run an elaborate R RPO system. Uh, and, and for the last three years, we've been eighth in, in the country in offensive football. And as a result of having good athletes, but as a result of having smart football players. And so this first slide is really just kind of talks about RPO as it relates to the basics. And, and I kind of, I'll kind of read it verbatim. But like I said, you guys can eject. And simply, in my experience, inside zone is one of the most versatile weapons in offensive quarter coordinate has at its disposal. So whether you're a 10, 20, 21 personnel team, it doesn't really matter. Uh, there's any, by any chance, you can get into an RPO situation very easily, uh, just depending on what you're doing schematically. So it's really not typically when you see RPOs, you always typically see it in two by two, 10 personnel, where it's two receivers on each side. And they just, people tend to think that's just kind of the way it's always run, but I will tell you, you can get in 20 personnel and Rod will be the first to tell you with three good receivers and two running backs and a good quarterback. And that's even more deadlier because you can really 
uh, move parts and that 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 guy in the backfield beca- can become a H back and be problematic in a lot of different ways. So, so it really just doesn't, doesn't originate in ten personnel like most people seem to think it does. You can be in any personnel group and still be effective in your RPO scheme. Uh, let me go to the next uh, slide here. So this is ten personnel, which is what we're talking about inside zone ten personnel, and that's basically two by two with a run running back for receivers uh and and i'll show you a slide after this particular thing you know and when we get into 10 personnel and we get a situation where we have a, a five-man box for example four down one linebackers that's easy math for us we're going to run the football and it's really e- easy to do and, and quite frankly if we have a a, 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 sh- a one technique and a three technique uh under look it, we even like it better because we get two double teams at the point of attack, and I'll show you a slide of it, as opposed to one. But we always want to attack that bubble or when we get the double teams because we like the ability to move the line of scrimmage. But what we like to attach to it a lot of times is bubbles, but we also attack a lot of quick game routes to it. And it just depends on how those apex players are playing. I call them apex players, but they're actually uh, guys that try to defend the run in the pass. But I'll, I'll, I'll show you some slides on that. So... I like to, you know, I like to get in ten personnel, and if they don't cheat the box and they want to play games, and then we're going to make them. We cannot allow a guy in space to play two things. Either they're going to have to respect the pass or respect the run, and the quarterback can really manipulate that by what he does by using that back effectively and riding him down there, inviting the linebacker to suck down, and then we have things that we do with our receivers where we run spot routes. So I'm going to go to a, to a. Uh, a picture that gives you as an illustration of how we look at that in 10 personnel. So let me go to slide one. Can you guys see these slides? Yeah, we got you covered. Yes, coach. Okay. So in slide one here, we basically have a four two, four two nickel quarters look and what we're with the quarterback when he gets to the line of scrimmage he says what are my numbers he looks at this side and he says i got two wide outs here but i got an apex guy who is what i mean by apex he's a sam but he's he's there for the run also sometimes he'll come to squeeze and he's also here to deal with the bubble but they also got another guy that can come down you know and so we look over here as a quarterback and we say hmm we got a nice double team here if we want to run inside zone on this one technique, we like that. But also, we look at this guy. Hmm, he's in the box. So if he's not walked, walked out that box, right now we already know. We don't even have to even talk about it. The quarterback already knows he's going to ride this guy down and still invite him down if he wants to shoot the gap. And we're going to throw this bubble. And so we like these numbers two on two versus this number three on two. Does that make sense? So on this principle, the quarterback can say he can keep it on because we're still good on inside inside zone here. But at the same time, we know that we're live on this bubble, and so this is very attractive to us. And we'll go ahead and ride this thing and throw this bubble right now, as opposed to going here. All right. So let me go back up to presentation. So let's, let's go down to the next slide. I don't know what I did here. Let me get that out of here. This is not my uh, forte rod when it comes to all this. This is what happens when you do it fast. I'm trying to get this out of here. I'm just going to highlight that. Because this really re-progression for the quarterback line of scrimmage, which I was just talking about. He needs to do do his checks to read pass. He wants to see what his passes look, what the numbers like in his pass. Do we have a numbers advantage anywhere on the perimeter? In this case, we have two receivers to the field, three receivers to the boundary, which I was just talking about. So if it's three receivers, what we're talking about to the strong side, we don't want that bubbles. But backside, we have cornerback, you know, two receivers, and we like that side. And so that's really explaining that last slide that we were talking about. Let me go to the next step. All right, re-progression continues. Here it goes. Just like most inside zone reads, the quarterback is going to read the backside in while he meshes with the running back and keeps it if the end chases the back. And so and this is something that will, can be determined in film study when you start saying, we like this end is really aggressive. And sometimes we start seeing that guy be so aggressive that we say, oh, we can waggle this guy and we can boot it. 
And so you start seeing that and do that. You really start using him against himself. Uh, he, bec he becomes the bait. And then that's when you can really play it. And we'll go a lot of times when we see the that end wants to chase, we'll ride that back and let the end just go eat him up. And then we'll have that number two receiver continue on a spot play. And the quarterback can keep it and then we'll invite that will backer to come grab him. Because really now we're dealing with the will backer. And as soon as that will backer comes to take that, to, to come get the quarterback, we'll dump it to that uncovered slot receiver. So it's a deadly situation if you get an end who is not disciplined, he starts chasing, we'll, re, we'll start playing, we'll playing with him and, and kind of start, you know, play, make him play against himself. So if the quarterback makes a keep read on the defensive end, the options don't stop there. And that's what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here. You still have the bubble screen. In this case, uh, you get this look. So if you got an overhang, overhang defender comes up on the quarterback, he throws a bubble. And so I'll show you a slide of that. How it relates to when we get an extra guy that we see. This is kind of another look where we have two doubles. We have a one and a three. And so in this particular look, we like inside zone here because we got a natural push at the point of attack. We can move this line of scrimmage very easy. This guy will log on to this tackle, will log on to this end. He'll keep it. But we get a double here, and we'll communicate that uh, with the lineman. And we'll double up to this guy, and we'll double up to that guy, and we'll play off of him. So we'll really, in this case, we got some beautiful look for us on offense because he's uncovered, but we got a nice inside zone read. And so they're really in trouble if they line up like that. It's almost irresponsible when you ask me. Uh, this is a situation where now we have still the inside zone, but it says if the quarterbacks, the slots are covered, uh, alert tight zone, two natural double teams, which is right here. So right here, we know that we don't like these looks on the bubbles. They're covered. They probably got some kind of man-free situation or whatever the case may be, or cover three or whatever. And we just say, okay, just go and run the inside zone because we know we're going to get four yards in a cloud of dust at minimum because of the fact that we're running two teams. Back in the day, and I'll give you an illustration when Terrell Davis in Denver, uh, Brad, you probably remember Dave Diaz and Fonte, they would run the zone scheme and teams got more sophisticated because defenses start shooting gaps, especially when they got in 30 fronts because, you know, we didn't know which linebackers were coming for, as an offense and they can start cheating the line of scrimmage and it started becoming problematic in terms of the linemen, particularly if you had uh, some linemen that were challenged with moving uh, laterally. And so back in the day, they would have this guy go up. He would just give hand presses and work up to him. He would do the same and you would get this guy on him. But what happened is, these backers start shooting and they start splitting. And so the, the zone scheme has kind of really evolved in where we don't look at it from the standpoint of just reaching a guy. We say, and yeah, we got these, this look here as coaches. You guys see this look and you say, you see that shade in the three? You know right now, you're running that thing right. We're doubling down and because you got, it's just a beautiful look for your double teams. And more importantly, your linemen love it. They rather... Uh, get two two bodies big on big and dry the cat and go to the next level than they than they would rather than to actually pull. You'd be surprised if you talk to them uh, individually. They'll tell you collectively they want to just knock your head off. And so in this particular case, like I said, you just go ahead and run your inside zone scheme on this look. It's ideal for it. Let me go to the next slide here. This is a situation here on on inside zone where this is a a bastard look now. You've seen that safety up previously, right? And then all of a sudden, you get a guy like Rod Woodson. He shows you that look, and he'd be down here at the last minute you won't even see him. He can just be up here, flat-footing, playing possum, and next thing you know, Rod's down here. So this can be problematic from the standpoint that you start riding that thing, uh, you think you, and this kind of is an apex look. Over here would be an, an, another guy here. I just draw, I want to just draw this here to illustrate uh, when you get this extra guy, as soon as you see this guy, and even if you're seeing this guy kind of like tilting over because pre-snap they got to, this guy got to get over there if they were in a too too high look. But the minute you start seeing quarterback pre-snap, you know, and this guy begins to be about 10 yards and flat-footed, that's kind of an indicator. It's kind of getting a little sketchy, you know, from that because this guy's in the box tuck. So, you know, but as soon as that guy, extra guy comes, 
as a quarterback, you still want to ride him, but right now you want to ride him. And gonna, now we're not really worrying about the end no more. We're really throwing off this guy. And a lot of times what I do is I would tell my whiteouts, and this is on film study, if we see this look and this guy's want to come down there and get, I call antsy and want to get involved in the party, I'll tell this F sometime to replace it. And we'll throw a hot, or what we call a spot route right now to replace that extra guy. So in this particular look, and a lot of times in a normal situation in the game, we would say easy, easy, easy. And then we're going to go opposite of this look because we know this is not attractive to us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, Charlie, yeah, question. Cool. Yes. Just real quick. So say you say you run to the bubble. Now, um, say, you know, we used to go uh, near back. If, if teams ran an inside zone, we would put our three technique to the back. If mm -hmm. teams ran that stretch to the other side, we will put the three technique away from the back. Mm -hmm. And then, so you're looking, you're always looking to run the ball to the, to the, uh, to the one technique, to that shaded yeah. nose. That shaded nose, because we can get a good job. We want to attack that. Okay. And then we belog it. And if we get in a situation, uh, Rob, where we begin to, uh, give up tendencies and whatnot and teams, you know, they get, they, they watch film too. A lot of times teams tend to put the back stronger weak. What I'll do is just say, okay, let's just get the back down here in a pistol, right? And then what we'll do is we get in that, that way you don't have any tendency. So now the defense has to determine which side you want to run the football to. Thank you. And so, and so that's another way as coaches. So you guys, coaches, you guys can also know if, if you start having problems with the defense, start getting an extra guy down there, it's pretty – Mainly, they're probably doing it because they don't figure you out through film study. It's what Rod's talking about. They'll begin to right. just kind of take advantage of where your back is aligned. So right. if you get in that situation where that happens, you put the back back here, and you get him in pistol. Now the defense has to be on. You know, you keep them honest that way. You you ever back. flip? You ever flip your back right before yes. the snap? Yes. You know, and that, and and sometimes you do it. What's your you know, reason? What's your reason to do that? Well, usually we want to flip the back because we want we want to be, have him have the ability to get to a back to the side where we're going to run the play. You know, sometimes when you have to go across the formation, it takes too much time. For example, if we were wanting to get in this situation, where we was like saying, "Oh, this didn't look good," and whatnot, we would go right here. Now we got a numbers advantage, and we'll go basically block, block, and throw the bubble that way. We're just flipping him to get a, a numbers advantage that gets us into a better play. Let me go to the next uh, slide. Okay, this is a zone versus six man bark wheel tucked. And that's the illustration I just showed you guys in particular run scheme. Uh, we had a tag, and this is speaking to what the question Rod was just asking. We had a tag that speaks to the backside tackle or the backside guard, uh, knowing that in, when, the, when we're moving that back, We'll, we'll give an indicator rod, and sometimes we'll run over there, but we'll let them know, alert, we might have a term that they know that we're coming back to you, you know, because we, we don't like it, you know. And then they were hit the tag, and we base block it to isolate wheel, wheel linebacker. And so that, that kind of speaks to the kind of the scenario that, that Rod was alluding to uh, when we move the back. You know, and then when we move in the back, we also tell in the front, depending on what the play call is, it could be a run or pass, you know, that we're, we're, we're changing the play to. Because a lot of times I'll move that back, Rod, and, you know, and sometimes, Rod, I'll leave him there, and I'll run basically what we call Ricky across the formation, and I'm just putting, putting him to the flat on the other side, Rod, but they ain't looking for him to come out the back door. Right. That makes sense, coaches? If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. It's not a problem. And so let me go to um, back to the um, here. I go to the next slide, and we can probably get a good illustration to that. So this is a situation here where the wheel gets tucked. You know, now we got the one technique, but now he's in the three. We don't have a double team here. Does this look right? We don't like because we know if the wheel shoots it, we got a double team. He comes down, but we say this. <clears throat> We get that look and we get this guy. We get basically, sometimes it looks like they're in two threes, but there's a heavy shift. We say, okay, we tell this guy, the slot receiver, 
we, we tell him to read it. If we see, and this is through film study, that he starts to creep and he's trying to shoot down there and to take it away. And based on this front, we, we got to understand that as, as line coaches and whatnot, that, you know, this is going to be problematic. And so we, so we say, fine. And if he was walked out, then we're going to keep it on. If he's walked out over him, then obviously we're just going to keep log these two guys and go uh, double team that and we're good. But once we get this look and he's in that gay a gap and we cannot block him, now we be, we beat him with the throw. And although I drew this up here, I'm really telling this slot receiver to get here at a hard 45, and I'm gonna replace. I don't want to because I know this guy is coming down because he's he'll start high because he has to get his butt down. He can't start off too high because I know some work is coming. He's gonna have to get involved with some work. So I tell the slot receiver that. We're running the route off. Not we ain't worry about him. We're replacing this cat coming down in his a gap, and we'll throw a hot. So when we get this look in inside zone, but we still, mind you, don't have a problem with making this throw depending on on who this guy is. If he's not a space player, we'll ride this thing and get him getting cheesy in there as an apex, and we'll throw this thing out on the perimeter too. But ideally, my first throw is I'm telling the quarterback, you know, we're looking for this throw if this guy gets antsy. Now say say everybody it looks like that right uh, Charlie then that mm -hmm. uh that one technique where he he's more like a that offside tackle he's more like a G you know he's like right he's right. inside shade of the guard right but say right. say you bring say you have a tight front right mm -hmm. or even front let's say you say even front so you got you mm -hmm. know you got two threes guard, and then you, guard, walk, you got you double barrel your your backers you mm -hmm. walk your backers up into the A gaps. Mm -hmm. What would be your what would be the challenge for you guys with that type of look? Yeah, so what you have is what Rod is saying, what would happen is this guy would be over here and he would be over here. Now you're stacking these guys. Now you gotta say the lineman's gotta say now, okay, now it goes back traditional in terms of how we block zone because you know they're even. So once we get a guy that's even, we keep it. So this guy's gonna stay on him, he's gonna basically give hand presence but looking up for the backer play side where on this side this guy he got to keep he's got to stay on his guy right you know but at the same time understanding that if this guy comes so they'll be stepping so he'll step you get hand presence and he'll step he'll give him and he'll step and then he'll give hand presence step and then we still going to run zone so these linemen here i wish i can draw it basically they would work in unisys but they, he would step and work to get up. So would he, he would be stepping this way. He would be stepping with him. So these two guys here will be working up to him to get to this cat if they would double barrel rod. And then we would play off the end. Okay, I got you. You know, because now we don't know where, they, where they're going to come, but we got to protect ourselves by now working together down the line of scrimmage so we don't give up any gaps. That understand coaches so we we would ideally we want to double team them but now we got to understand if they're both head up in an even front now we got to say hmm there might be some twisting they might be some slanting some guys might be coming he can this guy starts in a even he slants cross face the guard and then they bring the backer and the reason why we block it that way is because if they're playing any games up front we got to be able to protect ourselves that makes sense and so you understand when that defense plays the even front, then you you might have to consider how you want to block that front from that point. I'll take you guys to another slide. Uh, take it. So I think this was the seventh slide, which is last slide, which this one speaks to RPO quick game. So now we talked about bubbles and we talked about you know, how we can attack it based on the funny even fronts over under fronts. And so bubbles are good and throwing hot off the wheel backer is good if he wants to come in the A gap. And we like all that stuff. But now we can also include quick game. And quick game can, can consist of double slants. It can consist of slant arrows. It can consist of laser screens on the perimeter. Uh, uh, I, I, the, main, the, the name of the game at that point is is attacking the defense. And so I'll show you guys an illustration of when we get basically RPO, but now we are adding RPO quick game to the fold, which is a whole nother answer to uh, how we want to attack the defense. 
Uh, and so, let me see here. That might be the first one. We'll go back. Oh, well, I can use this one. This is sci fi. So, this is an example of kind of almost an even front rod. <clears throat> we, we know when we get that look and this kind of illustration where that wheel backer might be, might be coming. If we get at a quarters look and we get free access, particularly if this play, if we on the boundary and we plan to the field, we'll basically throw, you know, we'll throw free access quick outs. We'll throw smokes out here. Smoke being at one step, put the ball on him. We'll sometimes throw two slants where we got a slant here and we got a one step slant here. Sometimes we'll throw a slant over here with an arrow over here. So we can get to quicks a lot of different ways. Sometimes we'll throw laser screens where we'll tell the tackle with a chip and come off to the next level and have this guy go down and block him. He'll go get here and we'll run our laser, razor screen. So there's a lot of different ways we can attack it in the RPO quick, but that's just, a, and next time we talk, I can put together some slides that illustrate a lot of different ways we can attack it in RPO. And then, and, and more or less when we get into 20 personnel, two back RPO, I really love it because that gets you into RPO play action mode where you can really take some uh, deep strikes down the field with seven man protection because now it, it looks like RPO, it looks like ISO, and now you're running those big over routes rod when we get all those safeties getting antsy coming down and we get, now we got three receivers and we running over routes and whatnot. And that's just another, another way to get to your vertical game. And that kind of speaks to the vertical game as you get into RPO uh, when you're adding two backs. And so it's really effective ways. And also it allows you to get into your power scheme as well when you're in two back RPO. Because really the RPO, when you're running your run pass up in your zone scheme, the beauty of it is you can get into your attack scheme very easily. And tack meaning we call it tack when we're not pulling the guard, but we're pulling a tackle. And that becomes problematic. And sometimes we'll get into a, the cat scheme when the center is uncovered and we'll run power and we'll bring the center as well. And he becomes part of the zone scheme. It, it just get into it differently. It, it becomes starts becoming into what we call the wide zone series. And that's something we'll be, we'll speak to later because that's a little bit different concept and how we attack it wide zone uh, versus tight zone. Any questions guys? Don't be shy, gents. Coach, I think okay. you're explaining it's just too on the spot. It's just too too perfect, Coach. Well, that's why that's why Rod that's why Rod 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 and that's imposes on me to do. And that's why you're and that's why you're demand, Coach. That's why you're demand. <laughs> yeah. Let me uh, stop. No, what if they? What Charlie? What if they cover uh, cover two? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you've been showing, uh, you know, yes. the two shells, you know, you got your corners, they rolled up, they're, they're uh, touching, they're touching number one receivers. Mm -hmm. uh, so you really, you really uh, can't run the bubbles with the guy pressing outside. Right. With, uh, you know, you know, normally when you're in cover two, you're going to have your, what we call poach player. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be in that, you know, 10 to, to 15 yard window in the seems mm -hmm. so you're going to have somebody over two what, what would be your guys' uh check with that is that an automatic run when you start seeing that yes we like because you know, now we know fundamentally we know that you know we got basically a, the, a box count that's favorable to us so basically you, you'll end up with basically a six-man box right and a six-man box is really good for us because now we can allow we can get inside so we can get the double team in there and we can get a push. But also, the nice thing in, in cover two, there are some passes that we like to basically, we can alert it, and we can get to our basically our basic package where we can actually get somebody in the middle of the field. And sometimes we can, we'll get out of that, and basically we'll check to a nice pass that we can attack to cover two with. So we get those looks, and sometimes you, it looks that we just got to get out of that particular scheme, and we'll attack it differently. Hmm. You know, that's why you that's why the beauty of it is you have those three plays we say let's just cover two and our and we might not be getting it done up front where we're getting our ass kicked for example and we say okay it's okay and what we do know we have the middle of the field is open and then we know we got those honey holes and so now we say okay we'll run those corners off and we know we're going to outside release those corners and then we'll start running stick routes in the quick game with our inside receivers 
Thank you, Coach. Um, sorry, I just got a question from David. Uh, David asks if you could explain a few examples of um, two back RPOs, please. Yes, let me go. Uh, let me do this. Let me uh, let me share. Let me share a screen with him, really quick. <clears throat> So let's go to some two back RPO. If they want to see two back RPO, RPO, they need to uh, watch a little Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> right. So this is an illustration of uh, some uh, two back RPO stuff. So. So we call this formation at my place is against three, three stack. We get a lot of that in high school football. So we have stuff that we can go to where we got two backs, 20 personnel, three receivers. We got a third odd front now. And so now we got guys working in Kahuna since these guys are un un uncovered guard working with the center blocking the backside backer. And then the front side guard working in unison going up to get this backer. And sometimes we like this where we get this guy, we got ISO. All right, two back also, but also we get him getting sniffy, trying to get involved, stop that. We throw off of that, and so that's an example of it. Over here, if we get free action, he's just backed off. We'll take a look at that, and, and we'll put the back, and we'll ride it, and then you know, we're looking at he's there with those smoke backside. But I'll show you another illustration of some two back RPO. Well, we make it look the same. Well, this two back RPO looks the same initially, but we're riding this guy, and we're throwing a bubble. All right, and that's one, and I'll show you a couple more. Um, where we two back RPO here. We're riding the back. He's obviously uh, sometimes we'll motion that way, make it look like outside zone, and then we'll bring it back door and run what we call Ricky, uh, where they got to chase the chase that player. And then there's another example of it when we have when we run in razor screen, for example. And we got him here. We ride the back again, and then we block that guy. We chip that guy. We get that corner, and we throw razor out here. There's another example of where we get we start playing games with them as we start showing rpo and got that breathing and then we go we you know we got a guy that's in trouble we go sluggo backside here and play with him i'll give you one more example of it where we go two back rpo and we go play action pass and we'll run switch and we know we got single high and we run stinger on the backside we'll max protect that we know we got a touchdown right here because we're going to hold his safety and so there's many ways uh and I can talk about, I can go on and on about RPO, but if we can get creative, we get nasty, we can get funky and really uh, jiggy with it. And uh, if you got smart football players and we can put the defense in a, a really bad position because we're going to make it basically look the same uh, from the standpoint of they got to they gotta line up the same, but, but really for us, we got can, different concepts where we can actually um, just tag things. That's another example of, RPOs where we got a lot of stuff where we're riding the guy and we're sending this guy down the seam. So, but I can go on and on. You know, Rod knows I'm a I'm a football rat, but um, uh, let me stop the share. But yeah, uh, but yes, yeah, it's, it's many ways I, I can attack a defense, whether it be two back, uh, whatever personnel group. It's just a matter of you know your kids being able to understand concepts and um, being able to play fast once they know how to line up. So I got some smart kids that, that understand it and I teach it from a standpoint of concept and then we just go out there and, and play fast. Thank you, Coach. Um, Coach Murray, you have a question, sir. Coach, um, do you change the footwork? Give me, give, me one, give me one second so I, I'll sure. lose that to get some battery power. He didn't plug his computer in. Yeah, I know, right? I didn't plug my <laughs> Yeah, You drink too many Moscow, what is it called? Is it Moscow? Moscow mules? Oh, he's, he's gone. <laughs> Wait, is, is that a local brew? or No, Moscow mules, some type of, uh, isn't it, it's vodka? or I think it's vodka, vodka drink, I think. Oh, right, right. Oh. I'm, I'm not a vodka guy, I, but being with Charlie, the first time I seen it is when I was with him uh, a couple years ago. And he had this little copper cup. It came out with some type of lime and lemon and some leaf in it. And he drank it up multiples. And so I was like, what is that thing? What is that drink called? And he was like a Moscow mule. 
Wow, that's, I mean, that's brave. That's brave. Uh, that's one. Of, I, I, hey, that's one of the best. That's one of the best drinks in America. <laughs> you know, I had to. I, I turned Rod on. I got to. I got to get him going. I got to get him to the Kentucky phase of it, but got to break him in with the Moscow first. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we got a little power now. Okay. So shoot, go ahead, Coach. Okay. Um... My question was about your, your QBs. Do you keep the, the, the footwork the same, whether it's uh, two back, one back? No, that's a good question. That's a good question. When you got two backs, you got a lot of times when you're running, because out of that two back look, you can also run your power scheme, which is a beautiful thing. So you can really run two different run schemes, your zone scheme and your power scheme, you know, out of that look, you know, that's the nice part about it. You can basically have that, have everything looking strong and then you can take that ace back and he can he can wax that in and then you can pull that tackle or that guard depending on what the shade they're playing and then you can you know run power the other way weak which is a beautiful thing because everybody's bumped over um, so the feet work i would say would basically change uh, relative to what you're running if that makes sense yeah. now in terms of just running zone scheme with uh two back and run back in, in terms of inside outside zone it's relatively the same when you start talking about power scheme, now you're probably taking it in if he's in the pistol, for example, you're doing stuff where now you're reverse pivoting or you're opening. Sometimes I like to just get it in pistol if I'm running power the other other way. And then I'll just have the quarterback get it and open at six o'clock, hide the football. And they don't know if I'm running it front side or back side, you know, they don't know. After a while you start, you know, windshield wiping them so much. But it just, uh, but I would say in terms of the, Footwork in terms of zone scheme in itself, whether it be 20 personnel or 10 personnel, it's pretty much consistent. It's, it's when it changes is when you start running your power scheme because now you got to sometimes open up and reverse pivot because of the fact that you're trying to, you know, you're, you know, you're trying to get out of, out of the way of the guy that's pulling or in fact, you know, and, and a lot of it has to do with you're under center versus you're not under center. So, because you can run it out of pistol, you can run it under center, you know, so it just depends on, how you how you're lining your quarterback up? Thanks, Coach. Thank you, sir. Uh, Steve Farrell, would you would you like to state your question, sir? Or you're, yeah. oh, you're good. Good. Uh, yeah, I just had a question. You see a lot of uh, O linemen becoming like ineligible receivers on RPOs. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wondered if if you've got any kind of system to stop that happening, Charles. Yeah, um, we kind of get them involved when you go unbalanced. Obviously, they have to report. And so you're talking about getting your linemen in, involved in it in terms of the pass scheme is concerned? If it's an RPO and then it's, it's, it's taking a bit of time to develop and the linemen go downfield. And then, or an RPO, yeah. they, you know, they, can't, they can't, you know, that's the thing. RPO, that's why it usually happens in quicks because you'll start getting situations where when I might man my RPO scheme, you know, when we're throwing it down the field, we we say we put in there PP, that let you know it's looking like RPO for us in the backfield, but the linemen know it's play action pass. Okay. So you have to what you have to do is say okay, you got to put something in there as an indicator to the linemen. For them to know on this particular play, so if you've seen on some of those illustrations, I had P uh, PP, which is play pass, you know, Q ISO, but even though it was Q ISO, right, but for the lineman, it was play pass. Okay. So that way you have to do that. So you got to double call it. So you got to just put, put a letter or something in there so they, so they know it's looking the same behind us, but for us it's different. Right, okay. Thanks, Doug. Any other questions, gentlemen? This is your yeah, chance. I got, a, oh. I got a question. So how would you get them to understand what's going to be ran? So it's an RPO, yes. You're reading uh, your number count in the box uh, to the to the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you, you know, how, how are they, are, this is a zone blocking system where it's they're the not really going down? System. They'll know it's, they'll know, right? And that's a great question, Rod. Right? They'll know that it's where it's going. And the only time they're going to know that it's changed when we'll say, we'll say easier or they'll, we'll, we'll give them an indicator. We'll say, okay, uh, green, green, green. 
you know, a red, 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 that's less than no be restarting. Yeah. So if they don't hear that rod in the cadence, then they know it's on. They keep it. Okay. So it's, it's a, it's a built-in. So it's kind of a, an alert that's built in, but you do it, Rod, with the cadence so you're not wasting time. Right. So, I mean, you're coming in with three plays, and then you got a live color? Yes. Or a live, a live word? Color. It's a color. So, color. We'll, we'll, so, so we'll say, okay, RPO, we'll say, for example, the play color come in, doubles right rip, uh, uh, 20 inside alert. And so they know that alert, alert is the color going to go in. So we'll say, now black 55, black 55. And then we want to see set. And then we want to see what the defense is doing. And then if we get any movement in the cadence, we'll go green, green, green. Green lets them know that we, we're going to keep it. Then if it's not, if we don't like it, we'll say red, red, yeah, zipper, H option, you know, then they'll know, you know. Okay, I got you. So it's, it's in a color. The color is just letting them know that we're it, it, either we're keeping it right or we're we're changing. I got you. Great, um, Senor Castillo, you have a question, I believe. Okay, let's just jump over to Coach Rick for now, and then I uh, get back to you, Victor. Coach, just to uh, go back to where you where you talked about um, going into pistol, so the defense yes. now now has to work out. Uh, you know, your running back can go either direction. Can you mm -hmm. talk us through a little bit about uh, do the landmarks change for the running back? Does the timing change? How Great do you question. approach that? Great question. So, if you're running, for example, uh, outside zone, all right, instead of tight zone, tight zone being being side zone versus wide zone and so if we're running for example wide zone and we're in the pistol and this is such a great question because it comes up in a lot of clinics all the time we know we got to account for that snap the running back does because he's not on the center and so when you're on the center he's just coming out at a 45 and we're going to try to get to the outside edge of that the inside edge of the tight end or the outside make up the tackle but in the situation where he's now in the pistol and the quarterback, so we tell that running back to get it to seven yards. And the reason why we want him at seven and not six, because if we get a bad snap and it's off, we don't want to mess up this track on outside zone. So we tell him basically get accept seven yards and take a bucket step at the angle where he has to get the track on. Next time we get on the call, I'll give you an illustration of that because we do it in practice. So he gets at seven, and we're only saying uh, get there because we want to account for the timing of it. And then he takes a bucket step so he can get the right track, for example, on outside zone. Whereas inside zone, you know, he can keep at six because it doesn't really matter what the snap is because he knows which side he's going to and the quarterback just turns and gives it to him. But for outside zone, it's this track is important because if he don't want to get too tight in there, you know, that's why we back him up because we don't want him get, being too tight once he gets that ball. And if he gets it and he's not, as for example, five, six yards, he's not going to get on the right track and it's might as well turn to an inside zone play because he's never going to get to the landmark. Because really, with outside zone, we're trying to get the edge primarily. And then if we get that cut back, we're reading hats. But, you know, and if we start saying that then we're not getting on the right side of them hats, we know that cutback's going to be there and that we'll log that backside. But typically, that land, that's a great, like I said, it's a great question. We have to be back a little bit more because we want to be on the right landmark to get to where we want to get to. Uh, coach, just to continue that thought process, if you find that you have a, a defensive line that likes to shift, does that change the, any kind of any of the landmarks? Is there a front that changes that for you, or doesn't, you, doesn't, do you account for that? Doesn't change the. And that's another great question. Doesn't change the landmark for the running back, but it may change the way you block it. So instead of sometimes, like you said, we're double teaming. For example, in tight zone, we want to double team because we're coming downhill, right? But in wide zone, a lot of times you got to shift in front. Like and sometimes that's why a lot of teams like getting in odd fronts because, and as, as offensive coaches, we like it. Any offensive coach would tell you he would rather much see an even front than an odd front, Rod, right? so that you know, Rod, right, that we hate it, especially if your linebackers and your safeties are good. You know, you got guys like 
rod than that can come down. So you 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 start getting a shift in uh, linemen. So you start stepping to where you're going. That way, if they're playing games and they're jumping around, it really doesn't matter. We're just going to be gap sound. So it'll just be a guess of we'll be stepping. All of us are going to be stepping aggressively because we know where we're and to where they're wherever the play is going. So that'll go back more. It speaks to more of of a traditional way you would block outside zone, particularly if they're playing games up front. And that's only when they're playing games up front. If not, we'll we'll block it the way we would block tight zone. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, sir. Um, Senor Castillo has some problems with the, the audio, so I'm just going to read the question on his behalf. Uh, he, he basically asks, um, is there a specific um, R, like rule, like an RPO rule against the 44 split defense? Well, yeah. Well, 44 defense, now you're talking about eight-man box, right? So we, we start beginning to look at it. You start looking at now, we like the numbers, and now we know we're going to see if your cornerbacks can play football now. You know, we got we got one on one on the outside. You know, and if I got some, uh, like if I got some war daddies on the outside, and you got eight, that eight man box tells you those numbers are not good, right? And we don't like it up there. But we also know that we're gonna get in ten personnel, and we're gonna get those forty four. They're gonna be in a forty four wide, meaning those two backers that that extra help. Either they're gonna walk out in space and deal with our slot guys, right? Or if they want to stay down there and, and take away that, well, they're going, to, they're going to see how they good they can cover. So for us, uh, we just say, you know, well, we if we like the matchups on the outside, we're going to attack it, and um, and then we'll go from there and we'll adjust to what the the defense won't stay in that look long once you got some war daddies on the outside that can take care of that take care of that look. So, yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah. Mr. Harrison, you may ask a question, sir. Hi, Coach. Um, just a question for me. On the place where you're using the slot to replace the wheel backer that's coming inside, do you ever get an issue with, a, with one of the safeties cheating down on that, on that route? Yeah, we do. And we like when they, start, when they start to cheat. And that's another great question, Coach. Then what we do then is we now, now we're running slug go backside. We're going to get him cheating down and we're going to work that guy because the other guy is also looking for that hard slant too. And we're looking to go sluggo and we're looking to do some things where we we'll do some kind of pump and make him pay, you know. And so a lot of times if he's cheating out, and also at the same time, we'll throw the bubble immediately. We'll ride the back, get the safety cheating down because we're throwing hot. And we can, as long as we get that guy to the perimeter, even if he's cheating down, he's still got to come down from depth. So we'll block that. We'll block number one. We'll block the corner and we'll just run away from him. And so... A lot of times he comes cheating down. That's just kind of the indicator for us is we're going to throw a bubble right now or we can do something on the outside where it takes a shot. So now that really we like it that way because now if I got a war daddy, you got the safety down, there's no safety help. All I got to do is beat your corner now. Thank you, sir. Stuff. Thank you. Great. And back to Coach Rick, sir. Coach, uh, it's obvious that the quarterback's got to make many decisions in this type of offense, how much time do does the OC, yourself, or whoever the, the, the main coaches are that work with QBs, how long do you spend with your QBs uh, and uh, the process? The, the biggest thing is uh, we make our quarterbacks part of the install. And as we're installing stuff, and as you, as you get with your quarterbacks, as you begin to install stuff, you just kind of begin to know what they like. You want to be able to know what they like and what they're comfortable with, right? And so once we begin to install, and, and obviously it's based on film study, you sit with your quarterback and you say, what do you see here and what do you like here, right? And then you really build it, build your scheme in terms of RPO, in terms of you know, what he's comfortable with, because you don't want to overwhelm him with, with checks and stuff, right? And so what you do is when, you get, when he gets involved in the install, he'll pretty much know you'll get comfortable with what, what he can and can't do. And then from there, we may limit some things or adjust some things to make it more quarterback friendly for him. And so it's all predicated on your quarterback being involved with the install and being comfortable with what you want. Because once he can begin to understand what you want and how you're trying to attack, the more you can put on him to make those decisions better. You know, but a lot of times coaches just kind of say, I'm installing this. And then they kind of introduce it to the team. And then the quarterback his first time is him understanding what was in your brain was the day that you introduced it to him. Whereas with us, we get him involved in the install and then he begins to let us know what he's comfortable with. 
And as a result of what he's comfortable with, then we basically build that scheme based on what he can. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, sir. Mr. Arellanos, Francisco, sir, you up. Coach C, just a quick question. Just expanding from what you just uh, explained. Um, how do you teach your quarterback, let's say, in a situation where, you know, you have your one technique, you know, your three technique, you know, the five technique uh, mm -hmm. on a 10 personnel, and then um, as you're asking the quarterback to read, you know, that five technique, the defense does a twist, right? And mm -hmm. then that defensive end ends up in the B gap instead. How do you mm -hmm. teach your quarterback to read on that? Well, you know, the thing about it is he's, he's at the mercy of one. Once he, he's reading, the only thing he's going to be responsible for we put on him is the box, right, and, and his numbers. And where is his advantage? Once he sees it, it's advantage, he's got to trust that the other guy's got to do their job. Now, you got to understand, every now and then, if the defense plays some games, they might guess right. But they can begin to twist because anytime they can begin to twist, you're running at them and playing games. They're not, they're not coming up at you, you know. So my whole thing is I like them kind of playing games a lot of times when we're running tight zone because really we're just knocking their damn head off because they're running laterally. You know, I think the twists in the games are effective in, 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 in passing when you're blitzing, which gives us more problems than it does in the run scheme. And so, for example, let's say you have that three and the five, for example, and we say, and then you have that one technique, and we're doubling that guy going up to the next level, and we tell that three, our, center, our guard tackle, we're going to stare on your guy, right? But then they twist, right? And so what we say, if the guy is, if my tackle's on the guy, he begins to twist, right? And then we know that the guy, if he's twisting, we know something's coming. And also the guard knows that something's, and if this guy's twisting, we know he's looping. And so we tell our guys, you know, that we're going to get on our guy. And if he disappears, you get your eyes back inside because we know that they might be blitzing a, a gap, right? And so we're not chasing no twisters and gamers. We're going to let them play games, but we're going to stay on our responsibilities, knowing that if something disappears, something's coming. Does that make sense? And so Yeah, you maintain your really, sound block in that respect. And yeah, then you're just trying to keep it easy to the corporate. Yeah, the quarterbacks, you guys got, got to know, do I like this play? Is, is the box count good for me? Uh, and if, if, if I'm throwing the football, do I like the numbers? And where do I like them at? And then you just trust the guys to do their they job up front. Awesome, Coach. Thanks. Thank you, Coach. Um, any other questions, comments, query statements? No, we're all good? Gentlemen? Okay. Co Coach Collins. Uh, thank you very much. It's very, very enlightening. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. You're welcome. Charlie, I appreciate you, man. Okay, for sure. I definitely uh, do. So yeah. where we're going to go is that, um, you know, remember Rod, Darren Perry? Rod, Rod I'm going to leave the call. Uh, I'm gonna, I got an appointment, but... Uh, I'll, I'll Great to see you, Coach C. Take care. See you guys Hope soon. to see you in and, London. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. I got to bring my wife to London the next time. Co coach, you, you'll, be, coach. You'll, be, you'll be more than welcome. They serve great Moscow mules over here, so we'll take care great of you. Moscow mules in there. All right. We're coming okay. to the UK. I'll let All right, know. brother. Bring, bring your umbrella. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Coach. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. You take Thanks, care. Sir. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Thanks. All right, Charlie. So, um, you know, that was fun. Uh, you know, Charlie, uh, he's been around. I didn't get to introduce him because Charlie just kind of took over as <laughs> soon as did. I said his name. Um, but Charlie, you know, Charlie, he's played, you know, he played at um, a place called um, uh, Cal State Northridge. He's an All-American in, in college. Um, he, played at the, he played at the CFL level for multiple years. And then he coached for, gosh, he's, he coached a long time in the National Football League. He coached for the 49ers. Um, Coached over in with Cincinnati Bengals. He's a receiver coach. Uh, he he really made Chad Ochocinco. He really made because Chad Ochocinco was a converted quarterback, and he made him into a really good receiver. Charlie's really good with his P's and Q's, and he, he dots all his I's and crosses his T's when he's trying to get things figured out. Uh, so uh, you know he, you know he he is he's he's a good friend of mine, and I'm glad you guys got to meet him. But to, to expand on what we started last week, and he's going to be on the call next week. So next week we're going to have Darren back 
and Charlie, and we're going to talk a little O and D again, and so they can kind of go back and forth and let you see how the mindsets works with game planning each other, um, and, and let you guys see that. But you know, I'm going to go real quick. We're going to talk about leadership, but I want to make sure we. Um, I want to show you guys um, a little something that Darren talked about last week. So remember, Darren, you guys got the screen. Yes, sir. So Darren, he was he was all about um, the three four defense. Uh, he he gave you your base coverages, your your tight me uh, two buster, which man, I I think I got at least ten interceptions off tight wheel with two buster because you think they look like you're playing cover two, obviously, but on the strong side, Darren was always talking about that uh, you play more of a man concept uh, in a real world uh, than the thirty three tight wheel the uh, smack fire zone. The in the nickel dime strong stay fire zone, and that's where I want to go. So remember, he was talking about um, uh, at the end that you guys have um, can either play it a spot drop, or you can play what they call match carry deliver. So I'm going to show you right here. And this is how the Pittsburgh Steelers play it. Uh, most teams um, try to play it like this. But uh, the Steelers have played it like this for a long time, and they still do it today. And it was developed from Dick LeBeau back in, gosh, when Dick was at Cincinnati back in the 70s um, when they were starting running the West Coast offense. That's where the West Coast offense started, um, believe it or not, in Ohio. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and Dick tried to match that, saying, okay, what can I do to still bring pressure but be solid on the back end. And he came up with this philosophy. So as match carry deliver, um, we kind of tweaked this a little bit when I got to the Raiders. Uh, we did do the same thing. Uh, I made sure this was put in. But you match anything that goes to the flat in your fire zone. So remember, your fire zones, you're bringing your five. You got three under, three deep, right? So you bring in your, you're matching anything to the flat. We see that, right? Anything to the flat you're matching, you deliver, so say this hot two, right? So right here, you see the hot two and the hot three? So if they're close, and what Darren was talking about, we would read that. We turned it into the term Jordan. Michael Jordan, 23, easy to remember for the kids today, right? Everybody knows who Michael Jordan is. Everybody got the jump man shoes. Um, so we would, we, we Jordan this two and three, if they're closer two and three, that means this hot two player and this hot three player, they're going to read these guys out. So if number two ran a shallow and number three ran a swing, that, that hot two, that hot two player, which is an X, cause he could be anybody, right? It could be the nickel. It could be anybody. It could be the Sam. It could be the wheel. Um, he would take the number three player, that swing player, and then his hot three would deliver this guy all the way back across. Because you deliver him back across because you don't know where the backside, the backside hot two player is going to be. He might be gone. Because say if this two runs a rail route right now, he, goes, he comes up that scene. With this hot two player, he has to carry that all the way down the field. And he's gone, so this guy has to deliver him back to what we always say color which is your teammate. But if no teammates there, then you just take him. So the match carry deliver principle is a, uh, it matches up faster than spot drops, which I'm gonna go over in a second. The spot drops is a little easier to, to implement for everybody, but when your guys under, really understand football, this is, I think, is the best way to implement your fire zones because you match up more like man and you match it up faster. All right, so you have your match, the flats, you deliver your crossing routes, and you carry all seams. That's what it means, match, carry, deliver, all right? And then the second one that he talked about was spot drops, right? And this is what the Seattle Seahawks are. So the Seattle Seahawks, whatever team is he, the uh, Atlanta Falcons run it, the 49ers believe it or not, run the same. They're from the same tree. So that's, you know, uh, they're from that same system. 
So they, they more spot drop. And we also did that when I was coaching with the Raiders. Um, and we called it 1099. That means, hey, listen, 1099 means 99%. We're, we have to know where you're going to drop to prior to the ball being snapped. We do not look back at our spot to drop. We have our eyes on the quarterback at all times. And we all shift with the quarterback. So if I'm the right X, let me uh, get a little bit bigger. All right, if I'm the right X, which could be a, a wheel, if you the left X, it could be the Sam or nickel, right? Um, you go to the innermost, to the outermost, but your eyes are always on the quarterback. This is the easiest thing to teach in any of your zone blitzes. And everybody's working together because we can bring the mic and everybody else is still working. And if we bring the mic, that means we're going to insert one of the safeties to take his spot. That's all we do. All right. So I just want to kind of – I gave this to Coach to share with you guys, but I just want to give back to you guys when Darren was talking about it so you have an idea of what the two differences are. So this is the, you know, four underneath, three deep. Um, because they're not adding anybody, but you could always bring another player and insert that safety, right? And then you have the match carry deliver, what I was talking about at the very beginning. So if you're recording this, you do have it. Uh, I just want to give that to you. And I know Darren's going to talk about it next week even more. And he's going to expand on more fire zones and some more exotic blitzes that uh, Dick would always get into and that Darren got into when he was eating at Green Bay with Dom Capers. All right, um, we have that. I'm going to stop the share real quick, and then I'm going to go back to our main topic, which I don't. Oh, here it is. Great, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. By the way, for for that. No, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. So. The main topic we have here is leadership and everybody here, you know, if you're a player, if you're a coach, um, you know, leadership, and I'm just going to read it verbatim, you know, leaders help others and others do the right thing. They set the direction, they build aspiration, the vision, and they create something new. Leadership is about mapping out where you want to go to win as a team, as an organization. Um, you have to, but you have to make it exciting. You have to make it dynamic. You have to be inspiring. But as a leader, I think this is the key. You have to use your managerial skills to guide the team in the right direction, the right destination, right? And here's a, a uh, Dwight Eisenhower quote, who was our, I think he was a 34th president of uh, the United States. But leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something that you want them to do because they want to do it. So just think about you as a coach, right? Think about you as a coach. You're, you're putting in a system and you're trying to get your guys to do something, but you have to make them want to do it, right? So, and I, I think, you know, even Charlie talking, when Charlie's in, when he's involving his quarterbacks in a discussion about what is he comfortable with, he's making him take ownership of saying, oh yeah, I know you want me to do it, but now I want to do it because you're giving me a little freedom to choose. And that's a part of leadership, uh, that, that vision of it. Um, all coaches have to lead in some capacity. All players, to be a leader on the team, they have to be able to lead themselves first, right? So, um, and I'm gonna go to what I always, in my career as a player, and I really use it as a coach. Um, but my leadership ideas, I have five, 10 points that I always use. And I use it for myself as an individual. Um, but I, I eliminate all excuses for failure. As a player, talent is good. But everybody on your football team has some type of talent, right? I mean, all you coaches, you know, everybody has talent. One guy might be more talented than the other. One guy's bigger. One guy's stronger. Um, you know, and what was told to me from Chuck Knoll, if you guys remember who that is, um, 
the old Pittsburgh Steeler coach. Um, but he told me way back in the day, uh, talent is not everything. Uh, it is This game is played more mental to physical. And it's the players who can remember what's given to them from their coaches, from their peers, from their self-study, and apply that back in practice every single day. On a consistent basis, they separate themselves from the average players. And it's so true. I didn't understand it when he told me that. Trust me, I didn't, I didn't get it. Uh, I didn't get it for a couple years. And then it just kind of clicked in my head with a guy named Rod Rust, who was a coach and who passed away uh, two years ago. But Rod uh, was the, he was the reason that my, I think my game t- went from a great athlete, a really good athlete to a really good player, a great player, because he changed my mindset of what football is about. Um, so eliminate all excuses for failure. Uh, you lead by example from the front. You take your, your performance personally because if you're proud to be average, so are your players. You know, so if you, if, you, if you come in front of them and you know guys, you guys around football, players, they smell phony. Players, they smell phony. They know when you're not being honest. They know when you don't believe in the system or a play or something, they know. So, you know, uh, but take everything that you do with them personal and, and show them from the front how to be as a, a player, as a man. Uh, this is a John Wooten quote, and I'm using his quote even though he coached at UCLA, he did go to Purdue. He learned his education. He got educated at Purdue University, which is my alma mater. So, uh, but to instill a competitive greatness, uh, perform at your best when your best is required and your best is required each day. And excellence is a habit. It is not an act. So it's the little things done the right way over and over and over and over and over and over becomes a habit. And that's what excellence is. If you see all the great players, you think about, think about um, Stephen Curry right now. All right. Best shooter in the game, right? When he's healthy, best shooter in the game by far. Do you know how, has anybody ever paid attention to him shoot a free throw? He takes out his mouthpiece. He puts it in his right side of his mouth. He takes one dribble and shoots. He does that over and over he has to make a hundred shots a day straight I would never make it I mean I couldn't do that but he has done that and so he doesn't even think about shooting he just shoots that's greatness when you do the little things right every single day that's what greatness is and if that's required every day if you want to be the best you you can be as a player as a coach then every single day We have to make sure that we're on our P's and Q's, right? That we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's. Uh, Number four, we'll give energy and not be an oxygen thief. Listen, I know me. I'm not the brightest bulb in the bunch, all right? And I don't know if you want to be the smartest guy in the room every single day. You know, if you're surrounding – if you're the smartest guy in the room, then who are you surrounding yourself with? And, you know, the great – teams have a really good culture from the coaches yes do they get along all the time do they have the same visions no because we all see the game differently every player every coach on this call we all can watch one game see a play and see something different we all see the game differently and i think the best organizations they listen to each other they listen to their players to a certain degree and you because you want to be heard as if you're the head coach your assistant coaches want to be heard that's all i mean my frustration when i was coaching with the raiders is that i would speak and i would be dismissed and i'm like you know and year you know year three we got on we were on the right track but it took a while so give energy and don't be an oxygen thief all right And then uh, fifth is uh, give confidence. The strongest still is well-founded. Self-belief is earned and is not given. 
And that's a thing for the players. Uh, that's a thing for the coaches. Uh, you know, players, you got to make sure that the players earn, um, you know, any responsibilities they get. Um, you know, players get more confident as they do the right thing. And as a coach, I would ask you to allow your players to make mistakes because they do learn by making mistakes. Listen, I, if we were, when I first got into the National Football League in 1987, and if we had social media the way it is today, they would have called me a bust. I mean, I was getting tore up. I mean, I was getting beat constantly when I first got out there. So allow your guys to make mistakes, but don't allow them to be repeat defenders or defend, don't, don't allow them to do that. But allow them to make mistakes and give them a chance because and then, you know, I'm, this is not in here, but as a coach, learn your learners. That's one thing I had to learn as a coach is that I see the game through formations. I'm a formation driven player. I see a formation. I'm saying he can run. They're going to run three plays out of a formation. That's how my mind worked. So when I became a coach, heck, I thought the players saw, saw the game like me. And they didn't. I got rep guys. I got, I got, you know, you got rep guys. You got visual guys. You do have some guys who see formations. Uh, you see some guys who just deal with personnel groupings. Everybody sees the game differently. And you have to somehow, some way, make contact with those guys and see how they learn. Um, I know for me as a player, it, I was big on taking notes and taking the right notes. So I would take my note. This is from NFL players. I would take my their notebooks and see how they were taking notes. Because if I said, if I read it and I couldn't understand it, I'm like, bro, you can't understand this. There's no way. So you need to take better notes, which I help him in school, because the better you take notes in school, the better student you would think he would be. All right. So uh, that was number five. Number six, have the utmost concern for what is right rather than who is right. And I, I, I think that is key when you're dealing with an organization. I don't care if you're talking about sports, if you're talking about your family, if you're talking about a business. It, it's not about who is talking and who is saying it. It's about what's right. And if you... If you are like that with your players, if you're like that with your organization, and then you, if you're man enough to say, hey, man, you know what? I made a mistake. That's, my, that's on me. They're going to have more respect for you than never to say sorry or you're never wrong. I mean, I'm never wrong in my house with my kids, and they let me know that. So every now and then I got to say, yeah, 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 I got you. I'm wrong. I, I got it. I got it. But it's the same thing everywhere. I'm making light of that, but I'm, I think this is very critical to put the right culture together to have a winning team, whatever that might, whatever that team is, whatever sport it's in or whatever company it's with. All right, number, that's number six. Number seven, always embrace all obstacles and challenges that come your way because they are, you guys know, you guys have been coaching for a while, I would think, and, and the players are on the, the call. You've been playing ball for a long time. So you've been playing sports for a long time. Nothing goes your way. Nothing's, I mean, you might have a game. I mean, I have like three games in my head that it was lights out. I, I didn't make any mistakes. But I played 17 years. I played a lot of games. And nothing ever went exactly where I want to go. Every single game, every single play, every single snap. It never did. So make sure that that when something goes wrong, you don't take it to the point where you can't challenge yourself to overcome that. Because as you overcome those challenges and obstacles on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, it's going it, it, to go back to number, number five, the well-founded still or the, excuse me, the strongest still is well-founded. But the way you do that is by overcoming these obstacles and situations that you might occur in a game and in life, all right? That was number seven. Number eight, to foster self-discipline, toughness, resolve, 
These three traits will allow players to be a part of a winning team. Listen, discipline is everything, right? As a coach, you know, um, I, I, guys are going to get beat naturally. It happens. That just happens. It happens in a game. But to be undisciplined, which I learned, I was a knucklehead young kid when I first started playing and I would do some stupid things. I got kicked out of multiple games for fighting, talking back. I mean, so I learned my lesson to be disciplined in a game and not to get over the, um, I don't get emotionally hijacked. That's what I like to call it. Don't get emotionally hijacked inside of a game as a player. Um, you know, and then, you know, toughness, toughness is a good trait. When you play a contact sport like football, toughness is a really good trait. Listening is also a good trait. But your resolve, and your resolve is the same thing as number seven. Always embrace all obstacles and challenges that come your way. That's resolve because as you overcome those, you do build your resolve throughout the weeks, throughout the months, throughout the years, after game by game, play by play. Play one didn't, you know, the first quarter didn't go your way, but the second quarter, you still got the second quarter. You still got the third quarter. You still got the fourth quarter. So build that resolve. Um, and then I, I think this is really critical for coaches. I, I really do. This is this the one, number nine, to encourage all their players to see the greatness that lies inside of each and every one of them. Guys, I, I think that is like the most critical thing there is. Um, you know, I played 17 years. I coached for, I coached in high school for uh, six years. And the one thing I do know is that players at times need to find who they are. High school players, hey, pro players too now. I coach, you would think that every player that I had on my roster for the Oakland Raiders when I was a coach for four years, that every single one of those players thought that they belonged. No, you, you would think by the time they got to that point that their mindset was like, hey, I, I belong. But it was, that's not true. I mean, because it's like they fulfilled a dream. They're in, the, you know, the leagues of leagues. It, when you talk about American football. And there are some guys who didn't believe that they belong there. And you got to talk them into it. You got to say, man, you belong here. You, you did all this work throughout your whole life. So, you know, that to me is to show that because each one, each and every one of them have some type of talent. Um, somebody's going to be a better football player than others, but they need to see and they need to see the person they see in the mirror. They got to understand that they, that guy right there, they have to like them. And they have to believe in that person they see in the mirror. And that time, and you guys know this, I mean, all you guys have been coaching for a long time. You guys are surrogate fathers, psychologists sociology I mean, you guys are everything you're coaches yes you're you know you're you're a grandpa dad what you're you're you have a lot of hats as a coach but the biggest one is to sh tell your kids like i i have five kids in my house and i gotta tell my kids that they are good that you are special that hey don't settle for that you're better than that and you have to do the same thing with your players on a daily basis. And the players, when you, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you have to like what you see. And don't always look for the, you have the answers at times. You can look for help outside, but yes, but you as a person looking in the mirror and you're asking for help, the person that you see in the mirror, that person can help you the most. So that to me is a real critical one. I'm a, I really believe in that. I'm a, uh, as a coach, as a person, uh, I live in the uh, Tony Dungy template to love on them, to, to see how good they can be. And as you keep letting them learn and love on them, they're going to keep getting better and better and better. And they're going to run through a wall for you because you show that you care for them more than being in a helmet. And that is critical. I mean, I love Tony Dungy. Uh, I was so blessed to have him as a coach when I first came in the National Football League. If I didn't have Tony, and I would have had John Fox. <laughs> and Johnny Fox was my coach right after Tony. 
I, mean, I don't know where I would be because Johnny was a screamer, hollerer, cussing everybody out. Now, me and John Fox are great friends today. But when he first came in the league, he was not like that. He grew into it. But Tony is what I needed when I first came in the league. And he gave me love. He showed me patience. Uh, you know, he challenged me to, to be a better person, to be a better player. But he showed me that I belong in the NFL. And you can be in the NFL. So that's my template. Uh, I would encourage you guys to – I know it's a testosterone-driven sport. It's a manly sport. Um, but I know you can win a lot of football games. Tony won the most football games in a – what what is that? Like a 15-year period than any other coach in NFL history. I mean, he had like, what is it, 12 winning straight seasons? Something like that from Tampa. He left Tampa went to Indy. And kept on winning. So uh, it can be done that way. I know that. It definitely can be done that way. Um, and number 10, this is the last one. A creating an environment with the fundamentals, because the fundamentals matter. Preparation, attention to details, and the willing to sacrifice are your daily requirements. Are all of them hard to get into? Yes, they are. Are they all worth it? Yes, they are. Because when you guys ever watch the Pittsburgh Steelers play the Baltimore Ravens and you go back and look at the, the scores of all those games, they're all played within 10 points. And the only reason is they have the same culture. The culture they built from, and you know, I got to Pittsburgh and the culture is already there from Chuck Knoll and Mean Joe Green and Franco Harris and Terry Bradshaw, Lynn Swan. That stuff was already there, but the Rooney family started the culture. I get to Baltimore. The culture wasn't there yet, but it was coming. And we started doing the same things that we used to do in Pittsburgh. Players to meet on their own. Uh, we started taking responsibility of what we were about and who we were as players and how we played and our standard of play had to rise up. And by the time my third year, very similar cultures and all the games ever since then have been so close that you strip down the colors they play very similar to each other and they have because of these core principles the fundamentals every single day every single practice what i call rtdt all right excuse me d excuse me dtrt do the right thing do the right thing every single day with your fundamentals, with your preparation, with your attention to details, and your willingness to sacrifice for the bigger cause. And what we like to say, be singularly focused. So each week you have a singularly, you have a purpose with your eyes on a big picture. So in the National Football League, our singly focus was a 17 week or 16 weeks. We have our games and our eyes to the big pictures to get to the postseason and win the Super Bowl. And you know, that's the sacrifice you have to make to do all the little things, the fundamentals, the preparation, attention to details. Does it take away from your family? Yes. Does it take away from your uh, loan time? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. So all that to me is what leadership is about. Um, and I know everybody has different philosophy, what leaders are. Um, for me, that's what it was for 17 years as I played in the time that I spent coaching, not only in the National Football League, but high schoolers. And I use these same principles for guys who wore the silver and black helmet for the Raiders that they, that they played at Valley Christian um, High School in California, in Dublin, California. So, um, you know, I know everybody has an idea about leadership. Uh, I know, uh, you know, I, I would like to hear Coach uh, Turk. I would like to hear what, um, you know, I know you've been through a lot. You know, your hashtag share the knowledge means you have a lot of knowledge. You have, a, you, have a, you have more gray hairs than I do. So you, got, you have to have a lot of knowledge. Uh, you know, I, I, but I'd like to hear some of your thoughts on leadership, too, uh, because I know you have it. Uh, I know a lot of you coaches have it. Um, but, you know, I just want to hear what, what you think, Coach. Uh, uh, Coach, thank you for, for sharing yours. Uh, I think that, you know, something I said last week 
really sticks with me through football. For me, it's about people. I think whatever you do in life, it's about people, it's about relationships. And relationships have to be honest uh, uh, and they have to be very transparent. That's the only way you're going to make progress and the only way I think that people will understand what you want, what your expectations are and what their expectations should be. And by listening, having that two-way street of being listening to your players or your coaches or uh, to your staff. I've been very fortunate. I've been the head coach most of my football career. But uh, being able to listen to people around you, to surround yourself with goodness, uh, I think uh, people on the same mission as you, I think that's very, very important. And in terms of leadership, I think that that is something that you have to work on every day. Uh, I still haven't come up with an answer of whether leaders are born or they can become leaders. I have no idea. I just know that I have to work on it every day. And, it, and my core principle is how do I make sure that people know I care? Um, and, um, and I think some of the things that you mentioned in terms of what players will do for you, if players want to play for you, want to play for the program, um, they will give you 10% more every day, very, very easily without question. Um, if you're going to be, uh, uh, if you're not going to engage, then you're going to get 10% less. So for me, it's, you know, when we talk about this kind of stuff, it's about relationships. It's about transparency. It's about laying out your stall and having your cards on the table facing up so people can see what you're about. But we could talk about this all night, Coach, because it's my favorite <laughs> subject. It's my favorite subject. And, and, and you know these gray hairs are actually silver. And, and my excuse is it's, it's one for every win because we've had some good times. So oh, good, thank you good. for asking me, Coach. You know, uh, yeah, I, honestly, I, I would like to ask uh, any other uh, person on the panel that's on the call right now if they have a take, uh, a positive take on leadership. Uh, I, I know we all have different ideas about what it is. Um, and just because we set this uh, platform up, doesn't mean uh, you don't have a great idea or maybe even a better uh, 10 points than mine. Heck, you know, I mean, you never, you never know until you, you get out there. So if anybody has one or has an idea about leadership or a fundamental philosophy, uh, you know, I would love to hear it. Everybody scared? No, coach, <laughs> I think everybody's I, been, oh, there we go. I'm, I mentioned something. Um, for me, it's about um, setting expectations and getting people to buy into those expectations so they become not just my expectations, but the expectations of the whole group. And once they buy into that, then you're on a journey together. I appreciate that. Coach, I, I, I don't want to be a leader. I, I want to go with you. I want to, I want to walk that walk with you. I want to listen to what you've got to say. I want to help you get better. And I want to walk with you. I don't want to lead you. I, I, I just want to be with you. That's my take of, uh, of, 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 that, uh, of this. Yeah, no, that, that's that's a good one because you know, sometimes people in the front of the room want to be in the front of the room, and some people in the front of the room are there um, to help other people find their own ways, and uh, and and that's a good thing also, and to, to walk alongside of them. Um, you know, somebody's going to be in the front of the room. Um, I can be you in. Huh? That should be Coach Rick. <laughs> he's, 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 got, he's got the beard for it. <laughs> he has the look. He definitely has the look. I'm next time. I'm going to get a shirt that says Silver Fox. That should be your. There that's you your go. new name. <laughs> uh, no, Coach, I'll, don't, I'll don't share. join in with these guys. Don't join in with these guys, please. And we'll, 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 get to, we'll get to the real stuff later on, Coach. Don't you worry. <laughs> all right, all right. I know there's some good stories on Coach. I'll, I'll, share, I'll share one, one for you guys. Um, see, see, 
some of you can guess who said this. Uh, it is better to lead from behind and to put others in front, especially when you celebrate victory, when nice things occur. You take the front line when there are problems. Then people will appreciate your leadership. And this was said by Nelson Mandela. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a real good one. You want because a lot of times the people in the front of the room, when the going gets tough, they don't want to be in the front of the room. You know, they they put their they put their assistants in the front of the room and talking, and and they don't want to take the heat. So instead of being in the front of the rooms in the good times, you're saying being in the front of the rooms in the bad times. And that's when people really appreciate you. And that is definitely true. And I think at the same time, you know, le leaders, what they do well is to ensure that you know, the people that work around get the right level of credit, you know. Because ultimately, when, you, when you're a leader, I think you get the privilege to also make others better and build those future leaders. And I think sometimes, you know, we miss those opportunities. We miss those opportunities to make sure that we put those people at the front to get the credit. But also at the same time, when there's a problem, you should be the one at the front getting the hit and be accountable. Absolutely. That's a good one. Um, I will... take on leadership. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, my take on leadership is similar to what uh, Coach Murray says. And it's um, the, the culture, certainly, that we have going at the O's is that you are, you, you empower people rather than just tell them how to do things. You empower them. You give them the tools. You give them the direction and allow them to build it for themselves. But you don't abdicate responsibility. You allow them to develop and you're there side by side to take them along the journey with them, with like they're on the journey with you. Um, so you've always got that support, but at the same time, you know that you're, 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 you're building your own kind of destiny, as it were. Right. I mean, that's, that is, that's good because I think, you know, when people allow other people to take ownership inside of whatever system team it is, that's the best, that's when you find the elite corporations, the elite teams. I know in, I know in the National Football League, when players take ownership of what is being, how the offense is being ran and how players are coming on time, if players are paying attention, players being on time, what players are eating, what players are doing after uh, in their social life throughout the, the, the season, uh, those teams are the best teams in the National Football League because the players took the ownership from the coaches who gave it to them. They said, hey, listen, we want you. And once, you, once they found that, um, you know, the coaches gave them that perspective and, and the players took that ownership. So I, I love that take uh, because I think that's very important to do. Coach, can I just add on from that? I, I was actually involved in a team that um, mutinied against its coaches. And um, everything you just said was right because they didn't give that to the players. The players ended up asking me to step in, and I only did that on the on, on the direct um, position that they then took ownership, and the team then ran themselves. This was a bunch of seventeen-year-old rugby players. And they were fed up with their coach bawling them out, never following the principles that you put up, never telling them how good they were, just haranguing them. My view of coaching is um, when you're training, that's where you make all your mistakes. So you don't bore them out for doing that because that's the best place. Make as many mistakes on the training pitch as possible because that's when you're practicing. Plus they were at an age where you don't know everything. It was the whole thing. But this is where you learn. You're going to be a great player when you get, you know, if you want to play for England, some of them went on to go and play for England. That was where it all went in. And it was a principle. Caring about the sport, caring about them, at the same time, bringing a lot of fun. Leadership, 
again, the old coaches that were the problem was they stood on the sideline and balled. My attitude to always get involved, show them what you can do. If they, if some of them put you on your backside with two drills, you like laugh about it, and they love that because again, it's leadership with them, and that is very important. But it's also not taking the good kids for granted because I had one kid, he was a backbone. I would put him on the t roster every single week and just because he was so reliable. And it was the kids that were more difficult were the ones who get all the attention. And I suddenly realized that one game, this guy, this kid benched himself. He missed the tackle and he was so upset about it. He felt he'd left the team down and somebody scored. So, and I said, my God, you, you've got it wrong. Every week you're reliable. And it's, it's those you've got to also look at at the same time. But it is leading by example and allowing them to, to also realize and spot the leaders within the team. The best is when you can just let them go and they go on the field and that's when you see them just take it on. And that's when you, a real success. You know, I haven't counted in results, but I think when you see the team absolutely grow on the field without you having to do anything and he's just thinking wow what monster did i create and i think that's the that for me is also the joy of it not having to worry about it and just say right they know what they're doing trust them we had a case where we were winning a game and i swapped out back line one of the kids went no 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 we're winning don't do it and i turned around to him and said what are you saying are you saying that you don't trust your fellow players to keep up the momentum no that's not what we're saying what are you saying oh don't don't break the luck we're winning don't make any changes and it's just like you've got to trust the team you've got to, everybody's got to work together they got it and they went on a lot of them went on to play some fantastic rugby over time and um i think back to when i played for <laughs> play for the a's that's what was happening without us knowing it 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 was that whole team the whole team attitude, everybody was very positive and supportive and uh, very much um, us against the world, which is brilliant. <laughs> I think that's hopefully, um, it still feels like that in the O's, hopefully. That's great. Appreciate the share. You're welcome. Guys, can I please encourage you to speak up because I know it's difficult sometimes, but this is a great learning Thanks. process for us to be able to speak to each other. Um, and, and it's not, and it's not because you're scared. We just don't do it enough. All right. I, you know, you, you can speak up right now, whatever you want to say, there's not going to be any kind of stupid comment. players. If you, if there's something that resonates with you, please do so. Here's, here's one coach that I want to share with everybody. And I, I know coach Rod will, will click perfectly with this one. Are you matching your actions to your dreams? Your actions are not directly linked towards achieving your dreams. Those dreams will stay as dreams rather than become reality. And these are precisely words from the mouth of Coach Rod Woodson that I learned in a session that in a, well, I said a leadership session that he was given as part of the Pro Football Hall of Fame Academy. Coach, would you like to talk a little bit more about those words that you said, which are very inspirational? Well, I mean, it's, you know, if you, if you think about the, a lot of times, and the most valuable place on our planet is a graveyard because so many people die not living out their dreams and they die with those dreams. They die with ideas in their heads that could have been profitable ideas for not only themselves, for their, their communities. Um, you know, we... We as a society um, sometimes take shame in f failure. And I tell people all the time, failure is an event. It's not a person. You fail at something. You know, I talk to the kids, kids all the time. You fail a, you fail a class. You fail a grade. You, you, you flunk a test. You're not a failure. You just flunked a test. Heck, I flunked a lot of tests <laughs> in, in, my, in my days. At, at Purdue, I, I flunked a couple classes at Purdue. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean that you're a failure. And I think that, um, you know, having a dream and to going for that dream, whatever it might be, is uh, makes you feel alive. And, you know, 
I, I try to get all the kids and that I've ever talked to is just to get an idea is that look, whatever you dream to do, there's going to be a, a, a uphill battle. There's going to be a, not an easy way to get there. There's no elevators and escalators to success. Uh, it comes through hard work. It does come through failure because we all fail. But we should all learn. Just like players on a consistent, just like every year you put in a system and players uh, make mistakes. Uh, that's how we are in life. And uh, as long as we keep going for our dreams, though, and going for our goals, that's what matters to me. Uh, and I think that's what should matter to, uh, you know, all the players that are listening that keep, if you have a dream, just keep, keep it alive. Just keep going for it. And that is an old saying, you shoot for the stars, you fall short, you still go high. And it's, that's a quirky old saying, uh, but it's true. It really is. So, um, you know, if you have a goal, if you have a dream, um, sh go for it, man, go for it. And because what's going to happen if you don't, life's regret doesn't give up, man. That, that regret that you have in your life, that never goes away. I don't care how old you get. It never goes away. But if you go for it, you, you can, you can tell you, I took a shot. I did. I tried it. It didn't work out. And that's, that's sometimes how the cards, that's how it's played out um, in the world. But, um, you know, if, if you don't go for it, you're going to always think about it in the back of your mind. What if? What if I did this? What if I would have done that? And that regret does not go away for a long, long, long time. So if you have a dream, take a shot, go for it. Uh, you young guys on the call, um, if your dream is playing football, man, keep working. Don't get outworked. Keep learning. Keep learning the game. If you want to be a coach at a, at a higher level, keep learning the game. Go to a bunch of clinics. Talk to a bunch of coaches. Get in touch with people and keep learning. Keep evaluating or keep escalating your knowledge of uh, the sport that you want to get into. And I, if you do that, then you will have no regrets when it's all over. And I think that coach is beautiful because it also links very well to what you, how you complemented that phrase, which is you got to match your actions, you know, that eventually matches your, your dream. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you do nothing, if I sit around, I'm going to get chunky. Right? I mean, that's what we do. If you don't, you know, I want to lose weight. And, but you say you want to lose weight and then you – you don't change anything. Well, nothing, nothing changes. You know, your actions, is, you're saying one thing, but you're doing another. So, I mean, heck, it was for me, you know. Well, it wasn't my dream to get, you know, bigger when I was coaching, but it happened. And it, it, but, you know, to, to get serious again, the, um, you know, people have to understand, you know, you have ideas. But you have your actions have to match the dream. And that's what I'm saying. Take the shot. Go for it. And if you don't go for it, you're going to have regret. And that regret can last a long time. I mean, I regret that I didn't keep running track when I got to the NFL. I regret that. I still regret it. I had the fourth fastest time in the world in 1987 in the 110 high hurdles. I beat every – I beat every – all the best hurdlers in the world that year, except um, Greg Foster. And I'm like, you know, I get to the league and I'm like, I'm just, I'm, all I'm doing is concentrating on football. And I'm really upset at myself for not doing both because I could have done both because they're two different seasons and I didn't, you know, so that, that's one thing that uh, I kick myself in the butt over and over about. So I would encourage anybody who has that dream, don't have that regret. Shoot, I mean, go for the, shoot for the stars. And if you fall short, you're still going pretty good. I mean, hey, Maurice, would, would you worth reading some of those that some of the coaches are sharing on, yeah, on the chat? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll do that in a sec. Uh, Coach Woods, I just, I just wanted to quickly say, whoever did your Wikipedia page, I think did a big, big boo-boo. Because they should have added that 13.23 uh, high hurdle PR. I mean, that's something to reckon with, Coach. So I might have to edit if, if you allow me to. <laughs> um, yeah, have at it. <laughs> but, uh, we, I mean, we, we had a few uh, posts on the 
the uh, chat. But before I do that, Victor, you, you raised your hand, sir. You, you know. Yeah, I just had a quick question. I didn't coach them. Thanks a lot for all your input and these um, webinars. Yes, have been amazing for the team and a great experience. Um, just wanted to say, for someone who's then had a great playing career and it wants to transition into coaching, obviously when you're on the field and you're leading the guys around you, like they'll gravitate to someone that does well and obviously puts energy into the interpersonal aspects of being as part of a team. But obviously when you're a coach, you're on the sideline kind of giving instructions and your results kind of sometimes depend on the people that's kind of getting on the field for you and haven't got that kind of instantaneous effect of being able to kind of make the plays on the field. What do you think are the key aspects of a, a coach's personality and the efforts that a coach puts, puts in to translate kind of that understanding, that ability to do it and not being able to get on the field, so to speak, as in, in transition into being a coach to make sure that that impact that they've got translates? Obviously, it's good to kind of get the knowledge and the understanding, but sometimes the best players don't make the best coaches. So what do you think is, are the key aspects of kind of being able to put that together? and be a good coach and kind of translate your ability into, into others, so to speak. The one thing I thought that um, when I first, my first year of coaching, um, our coach came in, he's like, look, I want everybody to make a skill and drill um, Excel sheet. So I want you guys, and I'm like, you're like I'm like, what, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, so every skill that you want to increase, I need you to have a drill for that skill. And it really made me think out of the box. Like as a player, I played 17 years, so I'd seen everything, but I had, I had to start thinking about like all the different aspects of playing corner, playing safety, uh, speed turning, quick feet, all the different like type, you know, drills that I could do for a certain skill. And, uh, you know, I, I, I encourage all coaches, whatever position you might be coaching, to do a skill and drill um, worksheet, and it really just it, it and you you because now you you have a kind of like a platform each week you'll have an idea of what's going on and you say I need to work you know you know Bob has to do better in changing direction. Well, now you go to your little thing and you have four different drills that you have for changing direction, and once the players start seeing that the drills make a difference in the game to them they're gonna start buying into all of them and that's the key yeah you know ball and as 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 ex players when you play a long time you 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 just as you become a leader you become kind of a coach on the field anyway when you're yeah. playing long enough but you still have to get to them how they trust you for what you're saying what's going to help them get better and to me doing that skills and drills I did it. I, I did it every year for four straight years, and it kind of tweaked each time, each and every year. But it really helped me see each and every position, because we shared it across uh, the coaching staff, and we said, um, and it gave me better ideas of how to be a coach. Excellent. You know, some ideas. My I had a you know assistant DB coach. He had certain things. And I'm like, oh, I never really thought about it that way. And uh, it just made me think out of the box and it made me think differently. So I think I would really encourage you to start doing it now as a player. So if you do become a coach, you have an idea of this type of practices and drills that you want for certain skills at that, at that position. Excellent. Because there was a video that went viral and there was a coach that was doing kind of some up downs, kind of spinning drills with his linebackers. And he was like a average size, a Caucasian guy, didn't look that athletic, but he was down there flicking around, running around, his backers were doing it with him, and they finished with some kind of, almost like a breakdown type thing, and I got sent to by my sister, oh, this is amazing, da, 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 da. and you could see that those players absolutely adored this coach, because he could do, and obviously he broke it down, think, giving them a read. I think you're talking about Georgia Tech. He was, he was a linebacker, was yeah, he linebacker, was a linebacker coach, coach yeah. at Georgia Tech, he was doing yeah, like bear... Was, uh, what is that? What is that called? Uh, when you're kind of up down. Thing. Yeah, alligator roll type things on the floor. Yeah, yeah. something like that. I mean, mm. so it was. He, he inspired them. Yeah, he look, it looked like they 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 loved him for that. He wouldn't do that for a guy. They wouldn't jump around and hug a guy just for a video that he didn't like. You could see they genuinely kind of liked this guy and the energy that he was giving them. You know what I mean? And he may not have been the best of players. I'm not sure if he was an actual great player or that. But you could see right. that he inspired something, and they're going to go on the field and, and bang heads for him. Do you know what I mean? 
But, and it, if we go back to what we said before. If you show the guys that you care for them more yeah. than being just a helmet, definitely they're going to do anything for you. And you got to have, you have to have, that's a game. Yeah. First of all, that's a game. I mean, listen, we're playing a football game. Mm. It, it helps us. It, you know, it, it, it can unite communities. Um, you know, in the NFL, you know, you can make decent money, mm. but at the end, it's a game. So you still got to make it fun. In some capacity, somehow, have some fun with your guys. I always, my first five minutes of our meeting room, we always talk life. Or if 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 a guy was, you know, having making fun, if they were jawing back and forth, a couple guys having fun with each other, I let it go for about five minutes just to let them have fun. Because you got to have fun in life. You got to have fun. You got to enjoy your environment. You know, when you enjoy your environment, you your, your production goes up 75%. So just, you know, I, but I would encourage you to do something like that um, just so you can have an idea. And then to show the guys you care. Talk talk to them about their girlfriends, their babies, their wives. <laughs> like I had, I had all my players write down their girlfriends' names, their wives' names, their babies' names, and their birth dates. Excellent. And then every time they had one, we sang happy birthday to the wife. We sang happy birthday to the baby. And then they sh- they saw that I cared about them more than just a player. Like you play for me, yeah, that's cool. But at the end of the day, you're not gonna be playing in ten years. But I'll know you. I'll know your family. I'll know your kids, and we'll keep that relationship going. And that's when they really start listening. Appreciate it, coach. Thanks a lot, man. And then on on that, uh, I think Steve Farrell had a uh, had a good quote here. Um, which reads, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you, how much you care. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's, that's, that's very, very good. That's a good one. And uh, I mean, yeah, I'll just you- say something there, Maurice. Um, yeah. You know, I've worked with young people uh, for about 25 years as a youth worker. And, you know, you can have someone who's is the greatest expert and who comes in to talk to the young people. They don't listen to him at all. But if you get someone else who's got a very good relationship with them, they'll they'll hang on every word he says, you know, uh, and, and they'll have much more influence on them. Than, it's not just about knowledge, it's about how you can actually relate oh, with stop. young people. Oh, Sorry, about that. Yeah, we're Sorry, Steve, make that point again. I thought that was a really good point. Yeah, I was just saying that, um, you know, it's, it's, I've worked with young people for a long time as a youth worker, and, you know, oftentimes we get experts come in to talk about something to, to groups of young people. But, uh, you know, if, if they've got no relationship with a the person, they'll just, they'll just, you know, zone out. But if you've got someone that, that the young people really respect and they respond to, you know, he, he can communicate much more effectively and, and the young people will be sort of hanging on every word that he says or they or, or she says, you know, but it's it's all about relationships really, particularly with young people. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Uh, Mark and Jay, Coach, I think you have pretty good, some good points up here. Do you want to elaborate on those or uh, would you like me to read them out loud? On your behalf, and my reading isn't exactly on par, so so I think, Coach, you had some good points there. Okay, so okay, I guess. Uh, okay, Coach, thanks for making me read out loud. Uh, right, let's see what we got. Uh, you said um, uh, 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 it, it's it's also about like leadership is about integrity in realizing one size does does not fit all. So that's a direct response from a message and response perspective. And then Coach Mark Ajay, you said, um, is positive criticism because we all learn by, by our mistakes. As long as we learn from our mistakes, we are progressing and improving. And Manchu, Manchu, you, you had a good point. You have a very, very, very long quote, a very long one. You want to talk about that, Mancho, or do you want to go read it out loud? Please, please don't make me read it out loud. Mancho? 
Are you still on the call? Okay, I think you have to, you have to read it, Maurice. Have okay, I ah, just make him read it out loud. Oh, God. oh, here we go. All right, here we go. Uh, so bear with me, coach, coach, coaches. Um, so the leader inspires and empowers his colleagues to find solutions to all problems. The leader is directly involved with the mission and entrusted to the group. The leader focuses on the process, just as important. It is just as important to focus focus where it goes as opposed to how it goes. The leader shares responsibility with his peers regardless of the outcome. And then the leader fosters opportunities and designs the learning process. I think, I think that was a good one. That was a really good one. And then we, we have Mr. Shaw. Sir, would you like to uh, state yours? I think you have a good one as well. Mine is just not, it's about, um, especially teams when people say, oh, you, uh, and you hear, I won't have it from other players criticizing players. I, I, every time I've heard that, I've nipped it in the bud. And if you do find somebody that is negative, and I would almost say to poise this within the team, I get rid of them. I'll be honest. Um, because you can't have that within the solidarity, within the, the unity where people are criticizing people, especially when you know um, it's not founded, they're not, no one's perfect, um, and it doesn't bring anything to the whole. And I've, I've only seen it sort of once within my sphere of coaching, and um, uh, it was a young man who was incredibly arrogant, and all, it, it all came from his father, I'll be honest. And um, uh, luckily, he thought he was too good for the team and left to play for a much higher team and absolutely failed because it, <laughs> end of the day, you always be found out on the pitch. You always be out, found out in the field. And it was about removing people who, who are negative from within the environment. And it, it is very important. Mostly it comes out of fear. They, people, a lot of people will criticize you because they're not brave enough to do it. Um, back when I first started playing marathon football, I was the only person I knew who, in, in my world who actually played. And a lot of people said, what do you want to do? I come from a rugby background and um, very much it was, uh, what do you want to do that game? What do you do? And if I'd listened to it, I would have quit. And thankfully I didn't. And I had the greatest time in my life. Um, but I'm never that sort of person who listens to anybody. I don't live my life for anybody else. I do it because I want to do it my way. And um, that's the most important group to do. And make it achievable. You know, in coaching, it was, I know what I like to do with the team, but I'd, I'd break it down to what we can achieve on the day, in that quarter, on that half, in the month, in the season, and make it all achievable. And not listen to all the people, oh, you're never going to do it. You're never going to do it. Oh. If it was, the other thing was, if it was such a great idea, other people would have thought about it. You know, especially when that comes to tactics and things like that, always makes me laugh. Hank, actually, maybe we're, we're pretty good at what we do. <laughs> maybe you as a team are pretty good and maybe you're going to win this one. And, you know, since you get that little voice inside your head that other people love to put in there, um, that's when it goes wrong. Ignore them. Know how good you are. Know how brave you are. Just by taking that journey, you're brave. Just by stepping onto the field or suiting up, that is when you become brave. Standing with your teammates at the toy, coin toss, all of those prepared to run out in front of the crowd, all those moments. And again, especially it's easy when it's all going well. It's more important when it isn't going well. That's when you see how tough guys are is when it's not going well who actually stands and uh yeah don't listen to those, the negative people they're not in the field they're not wearing the jersey they're not on this call that's it really great and then david uh david said he wrote that once you realize that it's not about you you, you your journey into leadership can truly begin and uh coach rick before we get to you uh Coach Harrison, I think you have a good quote. Do you want to uh, read that out loud? or? Yeah, I will. So 
for me, coaching and kind of leadership in general, like it's great to achieve something, to go out and do something and achieve something for yourself. For me, it's even better to help facilitate, for want of a better word, somebody else to do something and achieve something great. Like for me, that's a greater feeling than doing it for yourself. So I think that's where this all kind of comes in. Thank you, coach. For Thank, sure. Thank you. Oh, um, Steve, Steve Farrell, you just raised your, raised your hand. Was that in a hand race or no? I just agree with a quote. Oh, or, yeah. oh sorry about that. Great. <laughs> Thank, uh, great. Thank you, sir. Uh, Coach Rick. Coach Woodson, are you ready? What's so, that? so you know, this sport is emotional. Right. And uh, meetings in coaching staff rooms and all of this kind of stuff can get heated. And there's many a man who wants to shout across and say, that's wrong. Wrong is wrong. And so on. Through leadership, through your eyes, you want to have that kind of balanced view, that balanced opinion. Um, but, you know, you want to have the relationship, like you said, get to know the girlfriends, do all of the, the thing that you do to show empathy. How do you draw the line or how do you use that to make sure that as a leader your point gets across in that empathetic way rather than the dictatorial way well I, I think you know you know as a coaching staff so let's say I'm, I'm an assistant coach you're the head coach we're going over the game plan for the week and uh you know you're you're saying you know we're in the, we're in the defensive meeting room and we're saying this is going to be our defense. Um, you know, I got some suggestions, but we're going to go with a different go a different way. So when you go downstairs, listen, I know I know in the National Football League, um, players can smell when it ain't right, right? They, they just know it. They they know phony, and they'll call it out. Now some of the veterans are calling out. I mean, I coach, so I coached Charles Woodson's last year. You know, Charles Woodson played eighteen years in the league. And if, if we came in there and said something crazy, we would be like, man, coach, we ain't doing that. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's to the point where I think when we go down there, we have a game plan. My players have, we have such a bond that my players know that when I come in that room, I'm not going to feed them BS. I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to be honest. We're going to put the best game plan we can together. Um, and they know from me that they're going to, they're, they trust me 100% not to go sideways. And sometimes we had stuff in our game plans that wasn't good for a certain position. And, I, I mean, you know, I remember um, uh, Reggie Nelson. He was our safety. And Reggie didn't say it out loud. Uh, but as soon as we broke the meeting, he came up to me and said, Really, coach, you let them put that in there? And it made me feel terrible because I knew it wasn't good for the players. I knew this, this, it was a certain defense that we were doing, and they had a certain check that was not right. And, you know, I fought as best as I could, but I can't fight against the head coach and the defense coordinators. When they made a statement, I got I to gotta go with the statement. And I was like, hey, man, I fought the best I could. This is what we're going to try to do. And if it doesn't work in the game, Hey, we sit on the sideline and we, we're going to be pliable. We're going to make a change. And uh, so, you know, for me, um, I think when you have those relationships, players really trust you when you walk in that room. And they know when you speak, it, you're going to be 100% transparent and you're going to do everything in your power to make them and put them into position to be successful because that's your job as a coach. And they trust you to do that. And, uh, you know, that to me is, I think, when you start building those relationships outside of or in your rooms and when you walk in that room and when you speak to those guys, they know, at least I would hope that they know that everything that you say is you're going to put them in the best position to succeed. And that's what we're about. And, you know, for me, that's I think that was, you know, I really didn't care about what other coaches thought about me. Um, in a sense that, you know, because I wasn't a screamer and a hollerer, but my guys knew in my room 
If I said, hey, I told you to hustle and you're jogging, they knew that meant a lot. I wasn't screaming, I wasn't hollering, but me just questioning your willingness, it means a lot. And I don't need a headache. So if I don't need the headache, I'm gonna sit you down and break, put somebody else in who wants to do it. That's what Tony Dungy used to do. Tony Dungy would come up to me and go, Rod, um, what were you thinking? <laughs> oh, Jesus. You know, I'll be like, I don't know. <clears throat> Sorry about that. That's all right. You know, and I'll be like, I don't know. But I knew what he meant by that. I knew the question meant, really, dude? <laughs> like, what the heck were you thinking about? But he wouldn't talk like that. So, uh, you know, once he just gave me a question, it made me want to be even better for him, to do good for him. And that's what I think having a relationship with your players can do because they know that when you walk in that room, you're going to put them in the best position to be successful because that's your job. And that's what you told them is going to be your oath to them as, a, as their coach. Thank you, coach. Thank you, coach. Uh, coach, one, one thing, you know, it, it's, 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 it's actually ironic because I, I just had that conversation with my girlfriend about a year ago and I was watching a, um, I think it was a football life uh, NFL series. And I told my girlfriend, like there are two coaches, former players and coaches that I would never, ever like mess with. One, coach Mike Singletary. Two, coach Rod Woodson, coach. I told her, like, if Rod Woodson and Mike Singletary tell me to run a mile, I run a mile. If they tell me to roll 100 yards, I roll 100 yards. So I, I, I doubt anybody would mess with you, coach. But yeah. um, no, but but I would never, I would never tell anybody to run a mile. That, uh, that's not that's yet. Me. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I would, I would run it with them. At least try to. I mean that that's leadership, right? That's leadership. Uh, thanks, coach. I appreciate it. Uh, gentlemen, any other quotes? Any other uh, uh, parables, statements about leadership you want to share? This is your chance, gents. This is your time. This is a no judgment zone, so don't feel you know intimidated or anything. We're all here to learn and 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 get some vivification. Oh. I'd like to I'd like to hear from one of the players. I know you guys are are on the call and everything. I'd like to hear from one of you guys what you look for in a coach, what you look for in a leader, because your feedback really helps us because I mean, certainly with the players that will play for me, I will be asking you those questions because I want to know if we're going down the right road um, and learn from you guys because my best teachers are the people that I'm trying to coach. So if one of you wouldn't mind, if there's something that you can contribute, uh, it would really help the coaches. Yeah, I think George, yeah, I, I thought George was getting ready. I could see it, George. Yeah, there's a QB. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, I, it's not necessarily answering your question, but it's just kind of backing up a lot of things that you, you, you've previously said, a lot of all of your coaches have said. Um, from a coach, what I want, and it's, it's you forever striving to get as much knowledge as you can. And it's the, we've said it before in previous calls, it's humility in kind of saying when you don't know something or you need to learn from somebody else. That, that goes for me as well. So I'm a QB, so I've, I've got to step up and be a leader as well. But the way I try to lead is the way I try to learn and it's use everyone around me. Um, and Rick, the question you just asked coach um, Woodson, um, I think it was like getting how to get people to see your viewpoint. And it's like, how can you make them make the decision to see it that way? Like don't tell them that way, give them a different scenario, flip it on its head, put it in a different scenario, like draw something up on the board and like, what would you do here instead? Like not say, okay, you didn't do this here. What could you have done differently in that scenario? Um, so it's, it's forever striving to kind of know as much about the game as you can. We're not all going to know every play. Again, not every offense is the best offense. Not every defense is the best defense, but it's, yeah, how can we all just kind of achieve to be on that same path? I don't know if that makes sense or, yeah. I, again, again, putting my hands up, I've, I've been out of the game for seven years. So I've got a lot of uh, learning to do, a lot of growing to do. And um, 
Murray's been helping me. You guys have been helping me. These schools have been helping me. So, um, again, thank you. And thank you, Coach Rod Woodson, because he's been amazing. Uh, no, thank you for your contribution, George. Good job, man. I'm excited to be here. I mean, yeah, um, we're, we're on the rise, as you say. Good man. Any of you, any of you other guys? I'll, I'll put one or two of you on the spot if you don't jump up. Tink. Yeah, Tinks. Tinks. I'm gonna put Tinks on the spot. Coach, you got you got to listen to this guy Tinks. He runs a podcast. You know, he's not a shy man, but today he seems to be sitting back. Tinks, you gonna contribute? Yeah, yeah. I was just trying to work out. Ah. The mic. Am I here? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, like, you know, in in terms of football, a leader's the um, the guy that physically he's there every play. Um, tackle, interception, fumble. He's there. He's just. Physically, he's there. He's got a presence. Um, he's vocal. And, you know, he'll be the one calling the plays, calling the strength side, calling the formations, calling the play before it happens. Well, this is just kind of what I've seen um, and what I define it as. And as well, he's the guy that if, if you're unsure about a play or, you know, a formation or whatever, he's the guy that you ask and he'll respond immediately because that's what you need to do on the, on the field as well. Like before the snap comes off, you've got to be quick. So I think that's a really basic idea, but I think everyone else has said pretty much everything else. So, Thank you, Tinks. Coach, he's a DB. Could you guess? Well, the DBs are the best athletes in the whole football team. You, don't, you know that. Everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Hundred percent, easily, easily, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. DBs, it's a, it's a, it's like it's a group. DBs, we all hang out together in every country, every city, every team, every level. It's a DB group. My personal opinion is, I think DBs are just filled wide receivers. <laughs> well, they're 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 more skilled because they're running backwards or sideways. The receiver knows where they're going. We're reactionary, and we're still covering them. Social distancing. <laughs> right. Who's that? <laughs> um, speaking on what, what Coach was saying, or um, Coach Rick was saying, um, personally, from playing in America and playing over here, um, my difference is I've seen on my first training session in America, I was probably like, 12 years old and our coach made us row 200 yards and that was my first training session so that was like a, a big eye opener and uh, the coach that I had at that age was like very down your throat yelling at you tough on you and it, and it does build character from um, what I found um, over here now I think because I play basketball as well so a lot of coaching from over here has been a bit a bit softer than what I'm used to in a sense and i also found that um captains are like the bridges between coaches but we don't really have that much over here um in that aspect so that's my little two cents that i want to put in thank you troy i mean you more be careful what you wish for man you got you got coach rick he's listening in he i i saw his reaction to that he's Take a note, sir. He's taking notes. <laughs> the coach Al is taking the notes. So that's, that's <laughs> and, and, and that. <laughs> Duly noted. Yeah. I think I think I think I think that's the first player I've ever heard in my life say doing barrel rolls down the field built character. <laughs> I don't think I would. I don't think I don't think it built any character. It made me itch. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I guess for me personally, it just kind of made, it set the tone of what the team was about. And um, if everybody was going to do it, you saw, you found out who was going to quit on the first day and who was going to dig deep and see how no, far no. you could actually push your body. No, I know what you meant. I know what you meant. I mean, it's when you, when you work hard, it, it does build, uh, it, it does forge something from in within. It really does. I mean, I, I'm as a 12 year old. No, I didn't think that as a 12 year old, I thought my coach was, nuts at 12. I mean, I, my little pal league coach, Dave Rohde, who were still great buddies. Uh, I mean, he would make us run uh, monkey crawl. We had a hill 
on the other side of our practice. So we had to monkey crawl up the hill for our conditioning. I mean, I thought we were nuts for doing that stuff. But uh, he was trying to build, as you say, character. But uh, when I was 12, I didn't think it was character. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what the receivers are going to be doing on the opening day of practice. There we go. <laughs> Good gentlemen. Any any other statements? Any other players, perhaps? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I've just got one more question for Chamoy. Actually, um, <laughs> he said DBs are failed receivers. Uh, I just wondered what he was doing tomorrow. That's <laughs> <laughs> Challenge is up. <laughs> oh, um, I'm a, I'm available. I'm available. I mean, I'm expecting a baby, but I'm all, I'm also available to hand out some some hang life on, lessons hang, as well. Hang on, Chamoy. Can we clear this up? What do you mean you're expecting a baby? That's what I said. <laughs> my missus, my, 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 my <laughs> <laughs> The due date, the due date is um literally any time now. Okay. Yeah. Well, now let's start again. What do you yeah. mean you're expecting a baby? <laughs> Listen, I'm 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 much in the process as as every as everything else. Oh, it's so a we expecting. we are expecting a baby. Okay, I'm expecting a baby. <laughs> I, I, I did all the work. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, yeah, don't don't listen. I've been married. I've been married 28 years. Got five kids. I've seen five babies delivered. I was a never expecting a baby, but I was with her. I was with her through the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um, yeah. So also, also want to say, Coach Rick. Um, also want to throw this in there as well. When you first came down to our sessions, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't like you. Um, oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> but after after a couple of training sessions and actually seeing what you were about, because obviously I didn't know anything about you, and for me, um, obviously I did like our our previous head coach beforehand. But the way you handled the team and the way you came in and, and just took control of everything and actually demanded people to do what you actually wanted them to do, that's what actually kind of drew me to you and, and made my decision easier to actually stay with the team. Uh, Chamoy, thank you. And I'm glad you turned that around because I didn't know where this was going to go. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as a lesson for all of us, we shouldn't judge books uh, by the cover. But uh, there will be a time, Chamoy, you may not like me again, but it'll be brief. It'll be brief. We'll we'll stay on that. Uh, um, we'll stay on the good vibes. Thank you. Here's here's an, here's a few more coaches um, from my own repertoire. Um, coaches, make sure that you create enthusiasm and generate energy through practice. Remember, you set the tempo. And you dictate how players respond to you. Motivate, encourage, and give positive reinforcement in every drill, every play. Remember as well that the players will play the way you allow them to play. And also be ready to offer that same thing that you demand from your players. If you demand intensity, commitment, and hard work, 100% or 110% effort, you ought to be ready to give the same in return. Great one. Nice, nice. Great one. Thank, Thank you, one. Coach Franco. Thank you. Uh, one, one final one. Remy, you, you good to go, sir? Yeah, evening. Um, my question is for Coach Rod. Um, as a guy that played in the NFL and played at top levels, I wanted to know, like, how did you keep motivated? Like, I'm talking training sessions. I'm talking like, you know, track, all that. And then from a coaching perspective, how do you keep the players motivated? Like, obviously, in the NFL, you're there and all you've got to do is just focus on football 25-8. But in other leagues, you've got guys that got to go to work or, I don't know, balance other things with it. And I just wanted to know, like, how do you keep guys motivated? How do you keep guys getting after it? How do you keep guys going to the gym, staying, you know, once you've got, you're like halfway through a season, I don't know, fatigue setting in, you've got, other factors and stuff like what are the things that you do to keep your players or or you catch catch you motivated? If that makes sense. Right. So I mean, it's, you know, for me, what kept me motivated is that I want to be I want to be the best. I want to be successful. And 
Um, I wasn't going to get outworked because, I mean, talent is good. You know, I, I was fast. I was big. Uh, I played corner, you know, 6'1", 205-pound corner. That's a, that's a big corner in the National Football League. Um, you know, but I didn't want to get outworked. And I, I think that was the biggest thing for me that, you know, my fear of failure pushed me to keep working hard and keep working hard for when I became a coach, you know, it's, it's really, when you play in the national football league, your job is one thing, train your body, train your mind to get ready to go play football. Now, if you are, you know, partaking in a, uh, with the team and it's, you still working and partaking with the team. That's, that's, a, that's another challenge. I mean, you got to go back to like, um, and I remember the stories from Dick LeBeau um, who played in the time frame where they made money. Yes, but they worked in the summer and uh, not during the season. So, you know, but he wanted to, his want to, uh, to still do it and be good at it was higher than him quitting. And I think, uh, you know, for all you guys who are, you know, choosing to play, uh, your want to to be here, to be on a part of a team, to uh, to win games, to win a championship has to be higher than you being somewhere else. And if that mindset is always there, it's going to keep growing and it can be contagious. Attitudes are contagious, good and bad. And if you have a contagious attitude that is strong and high and, and, and good for the team, other guys are going to pick up on it. Um, but if you're that guy who has that attitude that uh, goes sideways, we, we always call it go south, um, then that can bring the team down. So uh, I, I think for me, the biggest thing is for, um, you know, I didn't want to fail. Um, and, and, you know, for me to motivate my guys is like, listen, guys, either – you want to be here or you don't. I mean, that was my take as a coach. Like, either you want to be here or you don't. Somebody's going to be here. You know, in the National Football League, they're going to have 12 defensive backs on a team. Um, I would love to have the best 12 defensive backs on the team, but the coaches are going to make the decision what 12 best fit the team in our culture. And, um, you know, but for you guys who are choosing to do it, you know, that want to inside of you, that internal drive, that internal fire has to be there. And, and if that outweighs everything else, man, you're going to, you guys are going to have a good team. I appreciate that coach, man. Like, love for that. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, sir. Um, I guess we, we ran a little uh, over time tonight, uh, coach, unless you have another four hours to spare, I'm, I'm sure you, uh, you, you probably, uh, eager to to get on <laughs> with your day so uh where well, you guys are getting ready to go to bed well it's 9 24 p.m in, in in london i mean i guess it might be 10 25 in, in in other parts of europe but you know it's saturday who knows might be meeting up you know in britain down the bar you know i guess pre- is it premier league is premier league season still going on is, uh, is soccer still around no i think the last game's tomorrow Oh, last game's tomorrow. Oh, well, who, who knows what's going to happen, Coach? Anything can happen in this country. It's Britain. You never know. But, uh, Coach, I know I say it every, every week, but I just want to reiterate. You know, I think uh, I, I personally, myself, I, I deeply appreciate, um, highly appreciate it, you know, you taking your time of your busy day to really sit down with us and to have a very, per, you know, impersonal, approachable conversation about everything, football, character, leadership um you know the fact that that you have your friends come down here to to you know give us their knowledge to share their knowledge with us i think means a lot to me and i know it means a lot to to everybody on this call so i want to say thank you very 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 much for for doing that for us and then you know also uh, coach rick thanks billion for making all of this happen um and, and, and all the other coaches on this line with the o's in britain you know i, I mean i can't wait until we get to go back out there and play some football. I mean, or at least me watching you guys play football. I'm, I'm the uh, admin guy, so uh, I'm, I'm very excited because I know all of these things are about the advancement of British ball. So I'm, I'm very happy and, and, and excited to see you guys play. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it, Maurice. Uh, thank you again, Coach, uh, for partnering up together. 
Uh, can't wait to do it again next week. Next week is going to be both defense and offense. So it's a lot of real Ooh, football talking. Exciting. So it's going to be fun. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, sir. Yes, Coach thank Rick, you, coaches. Any final words, sir? I, I think, you know, every, uh, the whole point of this is to be able to pick up one thing, two things, or three things. And I think that, you know, Coach uh, a couple of weeks ago said, you know, it's your choice whether you want to be mediocre, good, or great. And that goes for coaches, players, administration people. It is our choice what we want to do. You know, I, I know where I want to be. I'm hoping you guys know. We've got coaches from Mexico, Portugal, France, uh, you know, Scotland, UK. You know, every, everybody's on here and we're trying to learn. And that's really great. And I think that Coach Woodson, it, we, we cannot sell short your input. I know we're working together on this, but your input is really making this happen. People are standing up and, and listening and learning because we have your caliber with us. So I appreciate it. All right. So, and, and the rest of you guys. Yeah, I appreciate all you guys being on. Uh, be safe, and I'll see you. I see you next week. Take care, coach. Another week. Thank you, coach. Right, thanks so much. Thank Looking forward to thank it. You, thank you, Maurice. Thank you, coach. Thanks, guys. Chamoy, good luck with the birth, Chamoy. Good luck <laughs> <laughs> and stay safe, everybody. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Guys. Have a good one. Bye.